Okay. It's live now. Good evening, Azusa. Today is September 21st, 2021, and it is 7.01. We will go ahead and continue with our open session with our item number 4.1, our flag salute. Let's go ahead and get started. We have Axel Mejia from Murray. Axel, are you on? Okay, you can go ahead and get us started. Hi, my name is Axel, and today I'm going to be leading you in the um, flag salute. Please stand for the flag salute. Please place the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Lady Thank you, Axel. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, are you how are you dealing with the heat right now? I see the fan going on. Very hot outside. Make sure you stay hydrated. Thank you to your parents for allowing you to come into our bar room through, through Zoom and leading us in this flag salute today. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great one. thing that I forgot to do that I would like to do at our school board meeting is to review our mission. And our mission is the Azusa Unified School District equips every student with knowledge and skills for college career readiness to fulfill their purpose and possibly impact society. We'll go ahead and continue with our agenda. And we have 4.2 roll call. We'll go ahead and start with board member Greer. Here. Board member Cruz and Salas. Present. Board member Bo. Here. And board member Rodriguez. Here. And myself, board member Brianna. I am here. At five of us that are here. Moving on to the approval of the agenda. If I can please get a motion to approve 4.3. So moved. The first by board member Greer. Second. second by board member Rodriguez Pena. If we can go ahead and get a hand vote, we'll start with board member Greer. Yes. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. Yes. Board Rodriguez. And board member vote. Yes. And board member Arianas, yes, that is 5 0. It passes. And our board approval of the agenda is passed. We'll move on to 5.1 Student Matter. Final settlement for Office of Administration and Hearing. Can I please get a motion to move 5.1? Move a motion to approve 5.1. All second. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena. We have a second by board member Cruz Gonzalez. So, can you try logging in again? There it is. Okay. Is Yolanda London? Now she's out. As we're waiting, let's go ahead and do a hand vote. We have board member Greer. Yes. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. Yes. Board member Bo. Yes. And board member Rodriguez Pena. Yes. And myself, board member Arianas, is a yes. And it passes five to zero. We'll go ahead and move on to our, our item number 
public comment or agenda on agenda or non agenda items. Do we have anybody from the floor that has fully blue cards? Any blue cards? No blue cards, so, but I have, I have some of them. Okay, do we have someone online? Yes, so far uh, we have three hands raised. Uh, first is Jenny Lee. You may unmute your mic. Jenny Lee, you may unmute your mic. She may be having technical difficulties. Uh, let's try our next one. Uh, Amber Fish, you may unmute your mic. Hello. So thank you board members for hearing me out today. Um, I wanted to bring up a couple notes uh, regarding our dual immersion program. Uh, I emailed you all last week or the week before regarding the changes that happened at Hodge. And I really want to commend the board and the superintendent and his cabinet for coming together and bringing up a meeting for our, for our parents at Hodge to let us know what was going on. However, I wanted to echo a couple of the points that were made um, to you in front of the board as well. Uh, we're requesting that the teachers that were most impacted by these changes, because uh, some of the class sizes ended up being larger, if we can look into getting those teachers an aid, some kind of support to help them out in the classroom, because instead of having that 26 minimum um, teacher to one to 26 teacher to student ratio, our first grade class is looking at a class of 30 students. Uh, also, more students packed into a classroom was a little discouraging to us um, because of COVID. We're still worrying with some of our children in social distancing. We don't know if getting a air purifiers in the classroom is something that is possible. Uh, also, I wanted to read from my notes what I had emailed you guys. Um, I was really excited about the smaller class sizes for our dual immersion program. Dual immersion takes a lot of work for our students, especially students who are not Spanish um, as first language learners. They're, my son in particular has no Spanish whatsoever at home. And I was excited to see him go back in person after a year of uh, online learning because it was a, we were able to give him um, the smaller class sizes I was hoping would make up for some of the learning loss that was given la um, over the course of the online learning. Uh, with a class of 30 instead of a class of roughly 15, I'm not sure that that learning loss will be addressed for students that may need it. Um, so those overcrowded classrooms were just really concerning to me. This is something that should have been addressed. We knew that we were going to be adding a fifth grade class. Um, I know that you had said that there might not be, um, there weren't qualified candidates. I, I'm hoping that this call goes out quicker and sooner so that we can hopefully find qualified candidates for next year for our sixth graders and additional classes that may be needed um, for support. Uh, also, I wanted to transition into, oh, I also want to say our, dis, our, our teachers are amazing for the dual immersion programs. I truly do love the couple that my son has been in and I look forward to interacting with more as the time goes on. I also wanted to switch over to reorganization really quick. I wanted to really thank the board for asking such great questions during the study session um, and asking for more information and clarity because I really felt as a member of the committee that that last parent, staff and student survey, that those numbers did not fully show what the parents were really wanting. And having that information, asking for what those surveys uh, comments were was a big relief because you'll get to actually see what the community was saying and not just look at numbers. So thank you board for asking for additional clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fish. Next we have Cecilia, Cecilia Ford. Can you please unmute your mic? Hi, good evening, Superintendent Ortega, Cabinet, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Cecilia Ford. I am the second VP, Chief Union Steward of CSEA, as is a chapter 299, and I represent the largest essential group of people within our district, the classified employees. I am here tonight to speak about the classified staff that pay for health insurance offered through AUSD. We hear all the time, thank you for all you do. We appreciate you. 
you're valuable to our district. How truly valuable are we and how truly appreciated are we really? Wow, so valuable and appreciated that most classified employees who have health insurance through AUSD can barely afford it. The cost of health insurance keeps going up and yet the district contribution does not. Folks are having to choose whether to put food on the table, keep a roof over their heads, or pay for health insurance that the state of California says we must have. Individuals must work two to three jobs to supplement their income because what they earn within you, with you AUSD isn't enough. Most of the earnings go to health insurance. Now ask yourself, when does that individual have time for their family if they are constantly working? When does that child who needs their parent see them? There isn't enough time in the day for their precious gems in their life because they must make up for their lack of earnings they receive from AUSD. We lose great employees because they can't afford to pay for their health insurance and must seek to find other jobs that will help them cover the cost. We have potential employees not want to join our district because of, this, but because of the disclaimer that they are told to read on all job postings. They would rather go elsewhere and feel more appreciated by receiving better benefits. AUSD's contribution to healthcare is one of the lowest in the surrounding area. The district is well aware of this and there is still no change. We will continue to stand up here and repeat over and over what our requests are and we will not stop until, until there is a significant change. Thank you for your time and hearing what I have to say. Come on, Azusa Unified, let's make a change. Have a great evening. Thank you, Mrs. Cecilia, for your comments. Next, we have Ms. Eliza Louise. Can you please unmute your mic? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, so I, hello, good evening, Superintendent, Cabinet, and Board. I am one of the families that was affected by last week's or the previous week's changes in the dual immersion program. Um, and I wanna thank the superintendent and cabinet for giving us a presentation and a space to speak. I'm gonna be saying similarly what I said then. Um, I see the positive of what could be for our program if we effectively meet minimum needs of needed teachers in the classroom now. And I understand that the district is hopeful about the sustainability of the program. However, as a parent and a previous elementary educator, my trust has been lost in the leadership and sustainability of the program for a lack of planning and not noticing lower enrollment. My trust has been broken and that if unexpected vacancies are to happen again, our children are at risk of changes in the future. My child, my first grade son, cried about losing his teacher who he loved. He found out on one day and lost her the next day. My student, um, and my son had another student added just last week after these changes were made, making his first grade class from 29 to 30, when district expectations should be 26 to one. And I understand that there's contractual changes and everything, um, but our students are losing critical attention needed and in an overcrowded class with COVID. Secondly, the issue not just becomes about hiring, but retaining teachers. Although teachers may have agreed to these changes, did they really have the option to say no? I remember when I was a teacher, I would not have had the option to say no to my, to my district or those above me. This concerns me about the mental health of teachers. Teachers are expected to set up new classrooms, say goodbye to students, create and learn new curriculum. Aside from shouting them out on social media and extra certification, how are we planning on not just hiring but retaining our teachers for the long term? So my request I mentioned last week is a teacher aid in all classes that go above the class sizes for a minimum of four hours a day. Number two, moving classes to wider rooms if the teachers wanted. Three, purchasing a min minimum of two air purifiers per class. And if the board is unable to do it, I will gather parents who will be prepared, who are already prepared to contribute to our classes. And it's, I would prefer not to. A plan to retain teachers in the future. And if needed, consider reducing kinder DI program to one class if staff may be an issue. Finally, in regard to last week's reorganization study session, I appreciate board members taking the time to ask questions and seek true representation of the community. It really meant the world. Model four states that the number one reason it is it would not result in loss of students. <clears throat> my children are in TK in first grade. If model four is chosen, this does not benefit my children in their entire educational career. Splitting resources and putting them at a 12 years old with older students does not be benefit them. Model four and the current issues with this dual immersion program will result in a loss of my students and possibly others similar to mine. I will forward this to ne necessary 
<clears throat> excuse me, board members um, and cabinet members. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lisa Louisa, for your comments. Is there anyone else? In we have no one else with their hands raised. Sorry, repeat that. We do not have anyone else with their hand raised. Great, thank you. Thanks, we'll go ahead and move on to agenda item 7.1, comments, reports, and requests by the Board of Education. We'll go ahead and start with uh, board member Bo. No comments as you need. We'll go ahead and start with board member Rodriguez Pena. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, report that um, I did go to the open house. Well, I didn't go to the open house, but I saw it online at the at the middle schools. And um, all the administration and staff did a great job. Either they had a presentation or they had a Google Meet with the parents. Uh, and I was very impressed with the math teacher, Mr. Uh, from Slauson, Ms. Stanley Mark Lark. He was offering his students and talking to the parents, offering the students a video. To show them how to turn in their homework, and the parents are very impressed about that because the parents didn't know that their child had that opportunity to, to be able to, to turn in their homework. So that's really good because I think it really helps students that are on hand learners and that, um, you know, they'll follow directions more by looking at it than reading about it. And, and, and I, I thank them for that. And also, um, I went into the um, class for Miss uh, Clavacia, and she's a music teacher. And something I learned with also, I went with the mariachi director, Mr. Rios Rodriguez. They mentioned the parents regarding them having a uh, music math, mass, and I didn't know there was such a thing. Uh, and the instruments also, I mean, I, I, I have this question that I want to ask you, but I don't know, did the music ones have a hole in the middle of them? Does anybody know any of that? Yeah, they do. Well, oh, thank you. Yeah, because I, I was I was surprised, but I know that the the um, music teacher when they sing, she says that their beaks are bigger, um, so that allows them you know to sing that it's not in their face. But I wasn't sure about the mariachi, and I know because they use trumpets and so forth. So you know, I learned something new. I also went to the um, this is a high school, the invading of the bronze plaque to rename the theater in the name of David H. Lewis. It was a beautiful ceremony. Many kind words were say, said about him. And, you know, Mr. Lewis was also a concert there. And the, um, they had students, staff, and parents speaking about him. He, this gentleman has a heart of gold. He just loved the students at the Zuzi Unified Food District. Um, they say he was always there, even the weekends. But they also thanked the Board of Education we're working, uh, you know, working on this so quickly and making this happen. They were really proud. I do have the the plot, well, the plot, but I have what it read. It says David H. Lewis, Theater of Performing Arts, teacher, mentor, counselor, 31 years of service, 1990 to 2021. All of the world, all the world's a stage. Shakespeare. Um. And I also, and this is a beautiful, we had a project this weekend at Memorial Park, and we had the garden cleanup. Projects where students, uh, well, they painted, uh, they painted the front gate, pull weeds, red mulch, and plant vegetables, and uh, flowers. And I want to thank the students in Mazuza Unified School District, the Interact Club from uh, students in Mazuza and Glasgow High School. A uh, third grade teacher from Paramount, uh, Christina Ramirez, and students from Christridge Academy, Ryan Serrano, Bill Deputy, for supervising Hilda Solis. We couldn't have did it without them, and they all came out to work together as a team. And it looks really nice. Those are the projects that were not completed the last time when Sanders Church when we first started to we continue what was not done. Also, I joined the celebration of Azusa 10 to 50 years of service. There was a total of 80 participants from 2019 to 2020, 114 from 2020 to 2021, certificated classified adult and management, adult school and management. 
I want to congratulate all the employees for the years of service, their hard dedications to our students at Duke Unified. But the big kahuna was 50 years of service, believe it or not, to my friend, former Mayor Joseph R. Rocha. Congratulations, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have board member Greer. Good evening, everyone. I just want to have one item to share out in that on October 7th, uh, at 6 p.m., I will be holding another uh, online copy. And so that will be taking place. Uh, and, and again, just want to invite any within the, the community, whether that is our parents, students, classified, certificate, any, any, anybody who might want to come in and, and, and discuss a, a number of issues. I, anyone who has uh, been to one of these in the past, I will send out an email to you where, where you can uh, sign up for, for this uh, meeting to get the information. And if you um, are interested in, in, in getting the information to be able to attend the meeting, then just send me an email. You can send me a, 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 a anyway, anyway, you can get all of me and I'll make sure that you get that information. But again, that is October 7th at 6 p.m. Great, thank you. Next we have Board Member Cruz Gonzalez. Yes, um, just a couple of requests. Um, I wanted to just make a request that um, we have I know, I know I requested it several weeks ago, but that we have this report in terms of how much money we have for, for food recovery at the next board meeting. Um, I know our report, I mean, our, our the the report to the state in terms of how we're going to spend the federal money is to do at the end of October, right? And I'm really uncomfortable to have you bring us something October, the, the second meeting in October, and then we have to see it for the first time and approve it, right? So, so I really, I mean, I'm, I'm making that request that we have at least something. On the, in, the, in the meeting in October, at the first the first meeting, it doesn't have to be a whole laid out plan, but at least principles so that we understand where we're going. Um, and then along those same lines, um, I did want to just circle back on the request to have an update on our the data, or what what kind of data we're going to be tracking in the data dashboard, right? And so I think understanding when that giving us a date as to when that's going to come to us, so we can have a conversation about it. Um, is I think I want to see that sooner than later. I think we made that request several months ago. Um, so that um, so those are my two requests. And then my last thing is to just welcome our new student board member, who is the the granddaughter of my mentor. Work. Okay. Well, I'm gonna see your parents on I'm so excited to have you here. I'm sure you're gonna be just as outspoken as Burke was. <laughs> so, thank you. Great comments. I do want to share that I've um, I visited um, about six schools, and it, they're just random schools. People are asking, why are these schools? Are they the ones that are on uh, Model 3, Model 4? Yes and no. I'm, I'm, I'm visiting, doing research. Um, I did go to the high school. That this is the high school, and I went to Gladstone High School, and I went during lunch. That was my first time going during lunch to see what it looks like on both campuses, right? Um, about the students, right? We're, we're looking into the reconfiguration, what it would look like, what you know, asking questions, um, and being able to do that research as a school board member to, to be able to, not only with the data that we um, got from our survey, but also being able to 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 do some more qualitative data, right? To, to get to, to get more qualitative data. And I was speaking with teachers, with employees, with students. Um, and so it was really nice to actually go to um, Gladstone High School. I went to both Azusa and Gladstone. And at Gladstone, we got a tour um, on uh, with Mr. H uh, Mr. Hague's classroom. And for those of you guys that have not been to Blackstone High School, Mr. Haig has, he is the computer oh, I'm gonna talk to media arts, media. Media arts um, teacher. And let me tell you, we have a really good program. It's, there's a quiet room where I, I, we went in and there's like, I, I don't know what to call it, uh, you can't hear anything like from the outside. And they went outside and I was in there by myself and I was like, oh, you know, and then they could hear me sing. So <laughs> that, 
was pretty cool. Um, he he developed a uh, an area where the students do their announcements. So that's new. Um, he has a green screen. I mean, come on, we are like on fire over here. I I did I, I, about two years ago or about a year ago. I went to another district to to go visit their media room, and I, I think um, you were there with me, Mr. Rafio. Our Buddha was there. Um, I think it was West Covina. And they, they, you know, they were, I think we're, we've uh, caught up or have passed um, what they have. And I would love for us to keep on supporting the media um, classroom and however we can, regardless of whichever model that comes through, and um, continue developing that. And so um, I did talk to the students as I was walking around the classroom and I kind of missed being in the classroom. So it was really, Nice for me to, to talk to the students and um, ask them what they were doing. And so I got a chance to, um, you know, they got the chance to share. Um, and so for those of you guys, you know, um, asking what we have here at our, our district, we have great programs at both of our high schools. So I would love to market more of what we have. To let others know, because I'm sure people at Azusa High or people that live within our community that don't have students that come to our schools don't know about these programs. So I would like to see more of the marketing um, of our programs um, on our websites and what they offer, what they've done, right? The, um, the media, I, I think they, they, um, they won an award, a film award, I think a year or two ago. Um, and that would, you know, so let, let's market our programs to get these, uh, to get our community excited about what's really happening here in Azusa. Azusa Unified, we're, we're doing great things at the high school. We just need to share with others. So just wanted to report on that. And uh, the elementary, what was really interesting, I do want to share, right? So we are asking indoors for masks. Students were out in the playground, you know, little first graders, second graders, oh, wearing their masks. No one's telling them to, and they're like, wearing their mask. And, you know, I'm saying hello, and they're saying hello. And, and um, even at the high school, when we were walking around, a couple of students uh, recognized me even with the, with the mask. They came up to say, hey, you know. And um, so th this, it's really nice to know that each student is taking their safety into their own hands and not only in the classroom, but, but outside as well. Um, I got to talk to a few teachers. Um, it was a great visit and I hope to continue visiting all of the schools and not just once, but a few more times before we make our decision. And since I was not here, when um, we gave our condolences to, um, you know, for our council member, Macias, um, Uriel Macias, I would like to publicly give my condolences to, to his family um, at this point. I've, I've known Uriel Macias for, for 30 plus years and worked with him on many different um, projects in the past, and I am deeply saddened for what was happening. I know that the services are this week, and I want to extend as part of the board um, our, our condolences and again, um, our love to the family this week. So thank you so much. Next, we'll move on to item number 8.1, comments and reports by, we'll start off with the student board members. We'll go ahead and start with, and I was gonna say this right now, um, I was pretty surprised to actually see our student board member which is Miss Anna Hamilton. She's from Azusa High School. And actually I've known her since she was a little itty bitty, um, little tiny bit. And I, I came in and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's right. And so I just want to welcome you. Um, feel comfortable. Please ask questions. This is your time to learn with us, um, to experience everything with us. And so welcome, Miss Hannah Hamilton. You are in the spotlight to share. Our homecoming game, uh, we have it scheduled on Friday, October 8th, and then after we have our dance on the 9th, we'll be crowning our king and queen then, and our homecoming game will be Beyond the Sea. 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had our first successful fall rally. We had our new Aztec warrior, Martin Cuevas, and warriorette, Samantha Sparza Crown, during the rally. We are per, uh, holding our first virtual Fall Academy Award ceremony tomorrow, and it'll be recognizing over 300 students with GPAs higher than a 3.25. We are also having our first virtual student of the month this Friday, uh, September 24th. And we are recognizing students for their outstanding efforts in and outside the classroom. Our first triad ends this Friday, and our Aztecs are doing a great job. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Anna Hamilton. Next, we'll go ahead and move on to we have Annette Camacho. Annette, are, are you on Zoom? Yes. Um, good evening, board members, cabinet, and superintendent Ortega. My name is Annette Camacho. I attended Murray Elementary School, Center Middle School, and Gladstone High School. I am currently a senior at Sierra High School. I am excited to be in the AP government class and to rep be representing Sierra as a student board member this year. The school year has been off to a great start. My classmates and I are excited to be back on campus for in-person instruction. The leadership class kicked off the school year with a water balloon toss activity and sports jersey day. We are looking forward to more spirit days this trimester. Congratulations to Ms. Sainz, our community liaison, for being selected as the California Continuation Education Association 2020 Classified Employee of the Year. Ms. Sainz was honored at the CCEA conference luncheon last Saturday on Thursday. Uh, last Saturday. On Thursday, September 30th, we have our Chick-fil-A fundraiser. Be sure to mention Sierra High School when you make your purchase. I look forward to sharing the exciting events that are happening at Sierra throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Macho. And you said September 30th, Chick-fil-A fundraiser. So if you guys are hungry that day, remember to support our Sierra High School. And we have Christopher Flamingo from Azusa, and she is not in attendance today. Go ahead and move on to our cabinet and superintendent for their comments and reports. Good evening, board. I would like to uh, provide you all with an update on our classroom technology. Uh, as you know, during distance learning, uh, we were able to take all of the, the Chromebooks uh, from our classroom carts and we were able to distribute those to students. Uh, we started replenishing those Chromebook carts over the summer. Um, one of the things that we realized was we also had Chromebooks that were reaching end of life. And so over the summer, we ordered another 2,500 of these Chromebooks. Um, it's definitely been a Herculean task. Um, very appreciative to the uh, all of our um, MIS and site technology uh, team who have been working really hard to uh, get, those, uh, get those Chromebooks in the cart. One of the things that we realized when uh, we needed to order an additional uh, 2,500 was we decided that we knew it was going to take us a while. Um, we know that there are many challenges, and um, we just really appreciate uh, everybody's patience as we've been trying to, you know, get these get these orders taken care of. But one of the things was that we also paid for something called a white glove um, service, and even though it it takes a, just a, it seems like a little bit longer um, uh, to be able to get the Chromebook. It's actually a little bit quicker because what happens is, is that uh, the service will put each one of the Chromebooks on the Google admin, on the network, and then what they do is they send a team um, to be able to get these devices into the Chromebooks fast. And so this is something that we've been waiting on for a bit. And I'm really happy to announce that the first um, first batch came in today. And so Lee Elementary was able to get um, all of their all of their cards except for two. They're going to go back tomorrow. Uh, the team came in and was able to do that. So uh, we're super excited. Um, just again, we know that this has just been really tough, um, but we are we are persevering, and so um, we're excited for that. Um, also, in terms of uh, classroom uh, teacher technology, uh, we've been working with the principals to identify um, any needed uh, projectors that need to be replaced, uh, document cameras, and all of those things as well. So we've got that, uh, that going on as well. So I just wanted to give you an update. Thanks. Good evening, Board of Education, staff, and community. I want to thank everyone who attended and helped out with our year of service presentation. 
event that we held yesterday. Although this event well, was held virtually, our recipients will receive their award over this next week at their site and department. I also want to thank our directors and principals for delivering the required annual, annual notifications and policies. Uh, thank you to our employees who have completed the mandated reporter and harassment training. And as a reminder, we have our live option to complete this training uh, tomorrow at Sierra High School at 3.15. Good evening, board and staff, uh, staff members. I want to give an update on our HVAC system. Um, as agreed upon, we did have all of our HVAC system service prior to the start of school. Um, but for many circumstances, such as the age of our units, we have been um, realizing a lot of our units are now actually uh, well, factual, can't say the word, but we won't have any technical difficulties throughout the day. Um, normally, this is not a factor for us to have a quick turnaround to address them, but due to COVID, uh, most of the supplies and items that are needed to address the um, items are on delay. Um, we are currently um, realizing a six to 12 week lag time on receiving parts that normally we can just go to Home Depot or other companies just to pick up. Um, additionally, to uh, have a temporary solution, we have started purchasing uh, temporary units. Um, we have recently just ordered 12. Um, previously, last week, we received eight that we have been deploying to different sites. Um, we have also invested in fans to provide those to the school sites as well. Um, today, I'm happy to announce that we were successfully able to install the new AC units at the uh, High School in Paramount, which had been down for over a year. We've been doing broker fixing uh, measures to keep them going, but we actually finally received the new um, Units today, and they were successfully installed. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, share uh, just my joy of being on campuses, uh, visiting classrooms, visiting with nutrition services staff, custodial staff, office staff, uh, and being uh, on the ground with the buzz, with the kids, with the parents um, is just the highlight of, of what we get to do. I um, also want to announce uh, that our uh, Education Foundation, the ALL Foundation, is going to be holding a fundraiser on Saturday, October 2nd. Uh, we are very appreciative of the foundation. Uh, they support many of our initiatives uh, that uh, happen in our school district, uh, not only at the student level, uh, but at the staff level uh, as well. And so I just want to show my appreciation uh, uh, to the foundation for this. I also want to join in on the congratulations uh, to your years of services of our uh, staff members uh, across the district. Uh, yes, we had the uh, Mayor Rocha, or Joe Rocha, uh, former mayor, uh, 50 years. We had so many, so many staff members, uh, 40, 35, 30, 25, just the dedication uh, of our employees uh, is, is amazing. So I just want to say, uh, congratulations uh, to them. Thank you. Yes, one of the things that um, I, I did overlook was that to congratulate all our all of our employees who have been here for the amount of years that they have, um, their dedication and just their commitment to Azusa Unified is is priceless, and we thank you. And thank you for that. Moving on to Item number 9.1, which is discussion and action of legal counsel at board of education meetings during open session. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this item uh, is on the board of agenda uh, tonight uh, to open up a conversation about uh, the possibility of having uh, our legal counsel uh, present during open session at regular board meetings. Um, the idea behind this was to add uh, a layer uh, for, for us as a team uh, to ensure if we had a question about process or procedure, uh, they would be there uh, to help us uh, navigate uh, those, um, those particular uh, situations. And so tonight, uh, we just welcome the board to have a conversation about that and hopefully uh, land on some kind of motion um, to move forward.
So, okay, so I'll be first. Um, I was just, my question regarding that is, um, from what I know, we pay $250 per hour, and if he's here three hours, and, and I'm not, I'm not sure he's aligned because I can't see him, or I'm not putting anybody down, but the last two meetings he was here, and in three hours, which is $750, he said one word, one thing. I mean, I, I, I know the purpose of it, and I know it's important, but I think we should have him when we're going to discuss things that we know we're going to need him. I, I, I personally don't feel that we need to spend that kind of money every single meeting. When he's on TV and then that's it. I mean, I I, I understand. I I just think that, well, I shouldn't say but it's like a waste of money. I mean, I, that's my opinion. That's how I feel about it. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I think for transparency sake, since we were we consider an agenda item, um, I think we should be uh, offer some clarity around. Um, when we do council started attending our board meeting because Mr. Superintendent, I believe the way you introduced the item, it, it seemed like a proposal. And in fact, we're, we're currently in that state. So can you clarify for the public and our stakeholders where we are and when it started? Uh, yes, I believe uh, the legal council uh, began, I believe it was two meetings ago. So that would have been I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that would maybe no. I think that would have been August 17th, I believe. I believe this is his third board meeting with them, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct, Superintendent Ortega. Thank you. So does anybody else have any comments? So I I I, I myself as the president, I felt it was the need and I brought this to the superintendent. Um, we, in previous school board meetings, it has, it has come to my attention that we've been violating certain ground acts within the board meeting. And therefore, it, and with this is full transparency, this is my first time being president on this board, and I'm grateful for this. But a lot of the times, um, there, there's times where, um, you know, we, we turn to a board member and it, it, it's important that we have, um, what is it? Uh, or, um, the word, um, the, 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 it's the protocol, uh, par parliament, the parliament and parliamentarian process. And sometimes we're not doing that as a board. And so to me, that's a concern. Because we, in the next several months, we're going to be, we're, we're talking about closing schools down. We're talking about, you know, um, the CRVA, which is the redistricting. We're talking about this. So it's really, really important that we don't look, when we have a question, we don't look to a cabinet member, to the superintendent, to a board member um, for, for answers to a question where, we can potentially be violating the Brown Act. So it is really important how valuable it is for us to be able to have somebody outside of the board and outside of cabinet to be able to go ahead and if we have a question, turn around, point of order, right? These are the things that um, I'm not experienced, I I'm learning but I'm passionate about what I'm doing. And so we need a little help. And that's how I feel that we can proceed and be able to learn at the same time. And for us to be able to learn, it might take, you know, it might take a few, you know, six months to a year. This is not something that is, is set in stone, but definitely that um, AUSD, AUSD needs at this point. And so moving forward, um, I, I think it's very important. Um, like I said, we've already in previous meetings, it, it has come to my attention by another lawyer that we have violated Brown Act. And I don't want to be put in that position um, as a board member that we are slightly violating a law, 
an ethic or, or certain things like that. And so therefore, full transparency, that is the reason why um, I asked for this to be uh, to be here. Um, and so therefore, does anybody and have? I think, you know, that, that's, that's the very reason, but I wish we would have had input or we would have known when he was going to come and be here. And we have input on that, on the discussion. I hear you. And I felt because we were going to start the CRBA, we're going to start this whole um, uh, talking about the reconfiguration. And therefore, that's why it's on the table right now. And we are having a conversation. You know, we're all 20%. We get a vote. We get a 20% a of a say. And therefore, right now, it's right here out in the table. And it is our time to be uh, to have this discussion, to be transparent. Right now, I just shared why I thought it was important. And as president, yes, I did make that decision to bring this forward for three meetings, which we did start, I believe you said August 17th. Right, because it was repeatedly. And so, you know, like we would turn to one board member and then we turn to the super, can you please ask the lawyers this? And then, okay, let me go ahead. You know, and so at this point right now, it is here now, and we here are the board that can make the decision. We can have a say, we can express how we feel about this. And thank you, Ms. Gil, uh, Rodriguez Pena, the board member. Um, that is why I have brought it up to the board for us to have a discussion about this. Yes. May, I, may I ask a clarifying question? Uh, only just for clarifying. Um, so when, uh, when we are talking about possibly violating something. Um, are we talking about Robert's Rules of Orders and Parliamentary? That's one thing. The Brown Act is something completely different. Um, so I, I believe that yeah. it's, it's the first bucket, Robert's Rules of Orders and Parliamentary. I just want to ask that question and, and make that make that clarity. Yes, thank you. And I stand corrected. It is, it is, it is that, the Parliamentary and the Robertson Rules of Order. And, and, and things that we have questions to about, for example, you know, something on the agenda item that we previously perhaps did not have and did not have a chance to, to ask it before. And we are going to be making a decision and we are literally against the wall. And so, but to me, I, you know, it is important to be um, proactive. And I see that as being proactive and being proactive and having that is is um, something that we we can go ahead and move forward if the board decides or, or we don't. And so that's why it's here on the table. But, so I had a couple of thoughts. Actually, and actually the first thing I was gonna look to clarify was, was the same sense that I have mm -hmm. that Mr. Ortega that you shared, which is us conflating the, or potentially conflating uh, parliamentary procedure with the with the Brown Act. Um, and and as we, I, I would agree that there are definitely some, a, a number of, of high you know, substantive and, and highly consequential conversations and decisions that we're going to be making in, in these coming, coming weeks and, and months. And at some of those meetings, I, I would, it, I do see wisdom in having legal counsel present when we are anticipating those conversations. I, I can see the value there. To Board Member Rodriguez Pena's point, though, as as we look at some of the let, let me let me tell the public none of these none of these meetings are boring. <laughs> but as we but as but as we look at some of the meetings that where, where we are where we are um, handling more of the mundane business that is that is necessary and needed for us as a district, I do question or wonder if if. Um, while, while I'm grateful for our, our legal counsel who is here and standing ready to, to respond to any questions that, that we have, I also um, recognize that there, the, the, the urgency with, to, to which we need a response to, to those questions as, we're, as we are addressing some of the more mundane business uh, that, that we have as, as a, an organization, I'm not, I'm not sure that it warrants uh, Board Member Rodriguez, Pena, you said 750 based off of you know 250 an hour, but there are times when our meetings are longer than that. And, yeah, and, and so we have dollars, dollars, four hours. Right, and so and so I, I'm I'm and then when we look at how many meetings we have a year and when we start to calculate that, that's a 
I, I, I would, I, I question whether the urgency of having a response in real time um, with, with, with our legal counsel, if it, if it warrants the, the that that amount of money, and and I, and it, and it, it does, it does at least at least make me pause. But before I, I feel comfortable moving forward with that, I wonder if a better um, use of resources. Would be for for us as board members to to recognize that that, that we would need and, and agree to as, as a standard practice to uh, be better trained in parliamentary procedures. And so, if we were to look at Robert's rules of orders, if, if, if there were if there were trainings that, that we needed to engage in, you know, once a year or once every two years or some, something along the, however, whatever the frequency that we determine, so that we're better positioned to, to build that capacity within ourselves as a as a board and not needing to. To literally spend tens of thousands of dollars a year, um, so so that so so that we are we're following parliamentary procedures. Parliamentary procedures are important. I I, I think that there may be more efficient uh, means of, of getting there and, and more efficient use of, of our resources to take care. Okay, what you're saying, um, I can throw this out there. Um, we can also do, you know, one of the things that we can also do. This is why I think it's important that we're having this, you know, this conversation. Um, we can do an RFP for a paralegal, right? Um, for this paralegal to be present, if he did not want the actual lawyer to be here, and I'm going to throw that on the table. But that's a possibility that we, can, as a board, can decide. We can do that. Do we know how how much they cost or how how I like to know that. Yes, Miss Prison. So, so I'm just gonna. Say, I, I just I agree with everything Adrian said. I think I was thinking on the line, um, and I think that um, I, I I think that we do inconsistently apply parliamentary procedures. So I think if we all have the same training and have come to agreement about how we're going to operate, I think that can. Help a lot of situation. I would also just say um, I would prefer not to take action on this item because I just maybe give direction because then that will just that will give our president the flexibility to be able to call the attorney in. If we start making actions, then it might put her in a box where she can't, you know, she doesn't have that flexibility to decide when the first needs to come in. But I think I'm hoping that you hear all of us saying that we think that maybe when there's a like a hot topic coming on, then it would be appropriate to bring in an attorney. But maybe the better solution is what Adrian proposed. Can, can we maybe get that some of the so one of the things that, that I hear us saying is let's look at a paralegal and, and, and what the potential cost for that would be. Can we also uh, get a sense of what types of parliamentary uh, you know, procedural training exists? I, I, if there's I, whether there's things that we can do through LACO or or or, or uh, CSC um, uh, uh, California School Board Association, if, if there's things that we can we can do for them. Can we get a sense of what some of those costs might be as well, just, just so we can uh, compare them? Um, or I suggest our attorney, so our they're going to often be interpreting. Right. Yeah. I agree. So on, on that front, a couple of things. Uh, we are set for our next governance meeting to get training on, on parliamentary procedures, and I believe that is October 12th. That's number one. Uh, just a quick peek at our current attorney, uh, legal firm, not saying that this is an industry standard, I don't know, but just looking up at the, at their, at the contract that we signed with them, uh, their paralegals range from 150 to 230 an hour. Can, can you clarify what the cost is for, um, so Arthur or, or Carlos, you can speak to that, what, what the cost currently per hour that we have our attorney? On? Two, $250. Okay. And, and Superintendent Ortega, if I can just raise a, a point, I think, we talked potentially about having a reduced amount for my services for the board meetings. So when we're talking about this amount, 250 is less than my, my current rate. And I think we also talked about the idea potentially of having a flat rate, understanding that sometimes you're gonna have short, shorter meetings and sometimes you're gonna have longer meetings. And I think um, board member Rodriguez Pena is exactly right. I didn't say much the last two meetings um, in which I sat in because typically the role as I understand it, as I've been asked to, to be here as by the board president, is solely to provide parliamentary procedure, to be the parliamentarian. And if the board is efficiently running their own meeting, there's no need for me to interject or kind of jump into the conversation. And the last couple of meetings I've watched have been very efficiently run. 
to to just add a full context on that. So uh, typically uh, it's three fifty an hour, and so two fifty is the reduced rate. Again, Carlos would be able to speak into this more, but just quickly looking at the contract that we signed with them, paralegal services run from 150 to 230 an hour. So one thing I also want to um, bring up, and I'm, I'm, I hear you guys, what you guys are saying, um, as I've attended other school board meetings in other cities, I, I see their, their attorneys actually present sitting with them, you know, and one of the things that I've, I've noticed um, within our in a, within our um, meetings is, um, for example, I had motioned for, for something and, you know, someone questioned, wait, can the president motion? And everyone's looking at each other. So for me, I, I feel that there is a need. Um, so then my next question is, could we have a, an attorney, you know how they have doctors on call? Or, or, or the, um, what is it, the um, paralegal? Is that something that, for example, um, you know, if we have a big item, yes, we can bring the attorney in. But if we could have a paralegal, and this is the question I think for our lawyer, um, Mr. Carlos, um, like when they have those documents. Yeah. And, have and Madam Board President, I don't see any problem with having somebody on call. In particular, when you have meetings that are going to be a little bit more complex, and you're going to tackle heavy issues. So I, I don't think that's an issue. Um, I do think that when you have an attorney, especially um, I'm helping the district with a lot of different e legal issues, it really is a twofer here because sometimes I'm actually read into some of the issues that are happening. And so I can kind of provide some background. I think a paralegal is great to support other things that the district is doing, but currently there's no paralegals working with Azusa. And so I would have to find a paralegal within the firm that could potentially be on call and make sure that that paralegal has, has to have the expertise in Robert's rules. So I don't know initially if it'll be a great fit, um, but something I'm gonna have to, to look a little deeper into. And just for clarity, I just wanna make sure that I understand and Carlos, that you understand. So are you saying like, for instance, if, if we went with a recommendation that's kind of going right now, like, hey, heavy items, let's have Carlos here for open session. More mundane to use a uh, board member Greer's uh, term, we're fine without him. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not saying that's where we land, but on those meetings, are you saying then, like, hey, Carlos, you're on call? So something, a hiccup happens, it's like, okay, let's pause and let's call the attorney. Is that what you mean? Is that, because I just want clarity on, on what that means. Yeah, well, we, well, we have a um, pretty much to what board member Cruz and Salas was saying that when we have a um, an agenda item where we know it's going to be heavy and bring them in. But all the other board meetings, like for example, if we know it's going to be a light agenda um, a meeting um, and he really is not going to, you know, be uh, needed if he could be a call. For example, there's sometimes I myself may ask a question like, hey, can this be done? I'm looking at you, we're looking at here, we're looking here for answers. And that is why I asked for the attorney to be here because we're looking at each other like, wait, can we do this? And we're looking at the audience and the audience is going like this or we're looking at board members and board members going, you know, we are board members. And yes, we are going to have that, um, that training in October. But this is an, every, you know, every two weeks we're having a meeting. We're making decisions. And like I said, when I've been at other school board meetings, at city council meetings, the, the lawyers are right there, ready. Any questions? And sometimes they do just sit there and just kind of what, you know, um, Carlos just shared, sometimes what he's working on with um, human resources or uh, with our CBO, with Tasha Mall, right, with MOT, or something that we may have a question on. He is already aware of what is happening. And therefore, we have a legal question about it. He's already here, and, and that was my point, and that's why I asked him to come because it, it had seemed that there was a lot of meetings where you know board member were asked, "Well, can that be done? Or can we do this? Wait, no, can we do that?" And and honestly, I mean, we're human, and I you know I've only been here about three years, um, and it's different being in the classroom than being you know in this side or being out in the audience than being here. And so I just want to be able, as a board member, all of us, to be able to, 
to handle um, our differences, meaning that like, okay, I don't think you could do that. Or this, you know, it's like, no, no, let's not waste time on, I'm doing all that. Let's, let's, let's just turn over real quick. Is there, can we, you know, hey, point of order, can we do this? Yes or no, how can we proceed with this? And then moving on. And so what I hear my colleagues saying is that um, the majority of them, what they're saying is that they are not comfortable with, with them being here every single meeting. But then what I am proposing is that if we can have him on call, for example, such as if you know, he is not attending, but we do call him. And since we do have a, say we have a question, right? We call him and we utilize him for, you know, I don't know, two, three, four questions for the meeting. And that can be like for about an hour. Is there something that we can work out that at every meeting he can be like on call? And that's what I'm putting out in the table. So does that mean if he's just answering a question for one hour, he gets the $250 and not for, the, for that, just that one hour, right? right. I think so we would. So we we would. That hour? Go ahead. I was just going to suggest that I think we we probably need to get a sense of what the what all the services are, and then we can work something out. But I think to to Board Member Rodriguez Pena's point, um, I wouldn't want to really bill for time that I'm not working. So I'm not looking at any kind of minimum one hour. I, and maybe what we can do is work something out where certain issues as they come up, if they're problematic for parliamentary procedure, you table the issue, um, and then you postpone any action on the issue. Somebody there in the room could text me, hey, we're going to have an issue. This is what's going on. And then I can make myself available towards the, the later part of the meeting. Um, also, I, I think to the Madam Board President's point, I've seen uh, legal counsel present um, for quite a few different school boards and, and city councils as well. And I think it does help sometimes having the legal counsel in the room as opposed to by Zoom. Um, and so I, I think everybody was gracious enough to allow me to participate via Zoom. But I think it, it might be better for the board if I was actually there in person for, for these particular meetings that we're talking about that are going to be heavy with issues. Uh, but, but board member Rodriguez Pena, I think we, we can work something out where it's really only the time I'm working will be what's built to the district. Thank you. So um, yeah, one of the questions I had is how, how would that play out? And so that, that's helpful to hear you describe that across or more the potential of that. I think there's more to be fleshed out to think through logistically how, how would that work out. Um, I have found that at times when we have gotten caught up parliamentarily, parliamentarily speaking, it has it has disrupted our meetings. And and but this has the potential of being even more disruptive for for our meetings. If we're asking a question, we're saying we're going to pause, table this matter, put a conversation out, bring the bring the item back, and discuss it later in the in the meeting. We might be in, in an attempt to solve one problem. We, we could be creating two or three other other problems. So that's that's why I, I do want us to be, be be careful. But I would say it's, it's worth exploring and kind of looking through what what that model could look like. Something I'd also be interested to know is, as we look at our legal, what what we pay towards legal expenses, uh, let's say annually, if we were to add this in, I'm also curious to know, not not right now on the spot, but but maybe we can be updated in. in what is the what would the percentage increase be that, that we would be looking at with with these added services compared to um because it's one thing for us to look at it on its own but when we're looking at um comparing it to what we what we might pay without it that that would be that might be helpful for us to to, to know and, and and understand as well as we're making a decision um but yeah i i even even the concept just to be clear even the the, the concept of Having a paralegal, which I'm grateful that we're going to look into to see what that could be. I'm, I, I would at this juncture, without without the additional information, I probably feel the same way about having a, a paralegal present as I would about having um, legal, uh, legal counsel present, just consistently and constantly in, in real time during meetings. Um, but but there's definitely the opportunity for for more information to be gathered. Another thing that I wanted to mention um, that I feel that. Um, uh, that is being said, and and, and I, I hear you, you know, uh, which is the cost. But in reality, 
if we look back in time, the Rossdale project at school cost us close to eight to ten million dollars in legal fees, and we still don't have a school. Um, you know, things like that where where we can learn from our past that if we be more proactive, yes, we do spend a little money. And that was, you know, an example. Uh, there's other examples where um, things can, can come. Um, again, we're, we're going through the reconfiguration. I think that I've already said that, but it, it, it is important that we be proactive. And yes, being proactive may cost a little bit of money, but in the long run, it will save us more money. So that's that's all I have to say. Um, I think it's important that we do explore, and and I agree. Let, let's explore, um, you know, something where what would it look like if um, if we had him on call? And I, I don't think that that, that was very clear. Um, it, so we would, if we were to call him, since if we would have a parliamentary question, then that's what he would he feel like. Point, you know, point, uh, what is it? Point two, two five. So it'd be like 15 minutes or about two or three questions or whatnot. And so um, it'd be interesting to, to find out. And again, this is an investment, I, I think. Um, and I believe that, um, and I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, Anybody have any more comments? Yeah, I would just want to make a request. Can we can we put this conversation on the at the governance study session on October 12th so that we can have um we can have a process question at a governance institute where it really should be um and and maybe just hold off this finish this conversation there. I, I just feel like we're going like I don't feel like we have a resolution right now, and I'd rather move on to the rest of the report Yeah. Comments? Actually, um, can, I just, can I just ask a, why would you would like it for a governance meeting and not a regular meeting where we have more attendees? Because I think that this kind of question is a process question in terms of how we run meetings. And generally, the best place to have that conversation is at a governance retreat. That's really the purpose of those, in my mind, that's the purpose of those, of those meetings. So it makes sense to have that conversation there. I mean, all our meetings are being televised, I think we'll have as much audience at that meeting than any other meeting. So, that, that's really what. Because I think we how much time have we spent right now talking about this? Um, and I'd rather talk about in, things that impact our students. At a regular I, I think that this does impact our students, the way that we run our meetings and the way that we proceed during our meetings. So it, it is important that we talk about it at a regular meeting. So we can go, the uh, superintendent and I can go ahead and discuss that and then get back to our board. We can go ahead and so since see here, I have a question um, for holding the council. Since yeah. we the majority would like this not to be an action item, so what do I what do I do? I think at this point you've had the informational discussion about the issue, and what I what I hear is that it requires further study to answer several questions that the board members pose. At this point, and, and not to put Superintendent Ortega on the hook, but often a board president would refer to Superintendent, Superintendent Ortega and say, can you please further discuss that and come up with some options and some potential pricing options um, with legal counsel? And then I'll have a conversation offline with Superintendent Ortega, and then we can bring it back at uh, the board president's direction. We can bring it back to a subsequent meeting. Okay, and what do I do about the action that we take no action? No action is necessarily required. This is an information and or action item. So we're moving on to the next item. Thank you for that. Great. And, and should, Madam Board President, and just, just before we move on, um, it begs the question, should I be staying for the rest of the meeting or should I sign off now? And it sounds like I haven't yet been formally asked. <laughs> Since you were asked to be here today, I think it's only fair that you stay here until the end of our meeting. Thank you. Understood. Thanks. Excuse me, Mr. Carlos. Um, I, I, I don't need to, I'm not saying that you're not doing anything. So, you know, I apologize. That's how you took it. I'm just, I'm concerned about the money, the money being spent. 
you know, not not that you're not doing anything or you're not doing your job. So don't get me wrong. Hey, and, and board member Rodriguez Pena, while I appreciate that, I appreciate that clarification, I work at the pleasure of the board. And I think you are absolutely 100% right. And that's often what a parliamentarian does. The parliamentarian's on call if there's a question. So um, I, I work for you, uh, Madam Board President, or Madam uh, Rodriguez Board Pena. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else? Great. Then we'll go ahead and move on to consent calendar. And it is from 11.1. .1 to 11.5. Can I please get a motion to move the consent calendar? So moved. Okay. We have a first by board member Greer. We have a second by board member Rodriguez-Pena. Do we have any discussion? I'm Seeing that there's none, let's go ahead and cast our vote. Perfect. That's correct. We have our student here. And we have, can we get the student preferential vote? Yes. Okay. And it passes by zero. Since there were no items pulled from consent calendar, we'll go ahead and move on to business and finance. We have 12.1, approval of resolution number 21-322-04, Annual delegation of administrative authority to process routine budget revision, adjustments, and transfer. That is, so we'll, we'll go ahead and can I get a motion to approve 12.1? Can I please get a second? A second. Do we have any discussion? Yes, I'd like information on this item, 12.1, please. The clarification. Yes, so currently, um, LA County is going through their ways of where we're upgrading our financing system, and we are on our path that we are on way four, where we will be um, transitioning to their um, more robust financial system. Currently, um, the district operation, if we want to make a budget transfer, let's say, for example, at Azusa High School, they wanted to purchase bleachers, they had $5,000. And their supply budget, but this is going to be uh, equipment that's over their allocation. They would have to put in a budget transfer to make that purchase. Right now, we cannot make that budget transfer until we brought the item to the board to approve it. Then they can put in the requisition to make the purchase. What this is given is the authority for the business office to do routine transfers between um, objects and funds, and then we will report all of our transfers that we put in has to be reflected in our first and second annual reporting. So then the Board of Education would see the transition after the fact, after it's done already? Yes, ma'am. Right. And currently, and if I'm being honest, currently that's already happening, but what's happening is we will do the transfer, but the sites will never see their transfer put in place. And so we're actually having approved requisitions for negative line, and then that's more of a cleanup process to make sure we truly didn't overspend. And then I'm also reading here where it says it's not to exceed Twenty million dollars is that is that like the cutoff that you can for the year without approval of the board of education? Yes, for the year. But there is, let me say it differently. Uh, there is not one transfer that a district could do that would equate to twenty million dollars. This would just be so, up to essentially. We can have the authority that throughout the year we'll be making transfers, and the cumulative amount cannot exceed that. And, and so, where, where did this? Um, $20 million come, come in? Where did, where did this cutoff come, come from? Each district is to choose their own. So we can make it greater, we can make it smaller. It's just yeah. given the authority to. Um, I'm sure I'm comfortable with the figure. Oh, not, not, not the process, I understand the process, but I am. I truly I'm understand. I'm comfortable with the $20 million. I truly understand. Have any more comments? So how would, yes, how would this process be any different than our current process that you, that you currently do? So right now, if you use the same example, if this is a high school wanted to put a transfer from their um, personal account to purchase the supplies for the students, they can put in the request. We can actually process the uh, transfer, and that day, they will be able to make that purchase for those supplies. Right now, they have to wait 
and so we can get board approval then they can make a purchase with their allocation that they were already awarded so our all of our sites receive um funding per student so that they can have a discretionary account and then they tell us at the end of the year hey Natasha put it in the supply account hey I'm going to buy technology but then things change and they can't make that change happen until we bring it to board even though this is already their funding that they were allocated and then, and then that was like the next question was, and so then all of these, all of these changes will come to the board eventually, right? Yes, ma'am. And they have been net to zero. So it's not like all of a sudden, as soon as a high school and have 4,000, but they're going to make a purchase for 10,000 and we're authorizing it, it has to net to zero. Is this for, for all of the schools? Yes, all schools, all funds. So even the all accounts, accounts is all accounts. Yes, and what, what would, um, so what would happen if the board did not approve it? Then we would go to the, we would remain in our current practice where our sites are putting requests for budget transfers and they would have to wait to realize those transfers until the next board agenda. And how would that affect, how would that affect the students? Well, I don't want to say that it'll affect the students, but it could be a delay in them receiving their items because we'll have negative funding lines. So what is it you say that we, um, at that point, is, is that the purpose of a special meeting, which is 24 hour meeting, if necessary, that something has to get done for the next board meeting? I don't I think a budget transfer will constitute an emergency meeting. Or a special meeting. I'm, I'm, the difference is a special or an emergency meeting. I think it's not probably more of a special, which is 24 hours notice. I think it's also important to note. <clears throat> Uh, like Natasha was saying, um, uh, including myself, we all set up our budgets based on what we think is going to happen this year. Um, and then, oh man, something like this, I, I didn't anticipate this, but I don't have enough money in that line item. So now I have to I have to move it. Um, and so it's about, um, this happens, um, I, I wouldn't say frequently, like every day, but it happens with, with some, uh, occurrence and so just that that purchase or that um delivery or that service then just has to be put on hold until we have our board meeting uh to uh, to do that um sometimes we're, we're talking about hundreds of dollars sometimes it's thousands of dollars depending on what specifically uh, it is and so this is just to expedite uh, those services and those and those materials, uh, not only for our sites but our departments as well. Another so you, you said you said sometimes it's hundreds, sometimes it's thousands. Just to be clear, it's, uh, so it's never been tens of millions. Never. <laughs> and if I can give a perfect example, um, our COVID funding, we did not have those funds at the time the budget was adopted. When we received those funds, we were starting to spend those funds, but they were never put in our financial system until we brought that to board. So that means in order to by our scanner, we had to allow negative funding transactions, meaning we are producing purchase orders with no funding allocated. We knew we had the money, but that's not best practice because ultimately, if you forget, you're going to spend the money twice. And so, this is putting parameters in place to ensure we're not doing it. That, that's a perfect example of maybe what a high high end could look like. Can you, can you speak to maybe what at, at that point, what was the height of those negative transactions? Oh, in the millions. In, in the in, in single the, digit millions? Yes. Single digit. We, Never since I've been here, and I've only been here a year, we've never had anything beyond 1.5 million as far as making a purchase, and that was literally if we we're buying Chromebooks or something like that. So, uh, because I wonder to, to board member Rodriguez explain this point, if if you, you, one of the things you said before, maybe as the conversation has evolved, you you shift on this, but you said you're comfortable with the process, but, but some of the numbers make yes. you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and instead of pushing this back, I wonder if, if that is giving anyone else any reason for pause. Um, can, can we look to approve this with the, the caveat that we adjust those numbers and discuss what those what those more appropriate numbers would be? Yes, sir, for sure. Yes, for Oh, so Mr. Mal, the, I heard you say that the $20 million threshold is at the discretion of the district. So can you provide insight as to how you propose that number in particular? Is that based on overall budget size? Um, it's just a percentage. Yeah, a percentage for our budget. So we operate over a hundred and twenty million dollar budget. Um, and so we just figured 20 million, which would be a safe bet. Um, depending on like we know for a fact right now, 
our SR allocation is $20 million. Um, once we receive those allocations, we want to be able to budget that and spend that. At right now, we would not have that liberty to do that. So that's where we started with that number. Thank you. And my, my follow-up question is, um, I'm, I'm glad that we're having this discussion, um, but I think for me, knowing that the checks and balances already in place with budgeting and allocation and allocation to sites, um, I haven't seen anything that would give me pause to think that we're overextending. Um, and I'm trusting the process here among cabinet and with appropriate board approvals. I, I, I would be in favor of um, uh, enabling our systems to be more efficient, to be able to get supplies and equipment into the hands of students and teachers, and really relinquishing that local control to the site, knowing that we have a strong process in place. Thank you. And I agree with Sabrina. I, th I think for me, the key piece is, is the fact that it states that non-routine budget revisions still must come to the board. So that makes it very clear that these are just routine items. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm hearing, I'm hearing both. Um, I feel the board is comfortable with this, but I do hear um, two board members or one board member saying that they're not comfortable with the amount um, but when you clarified it and when you shared that it's 120 million and being safe, um, that kind of came up with the 20 million. So um, do you think moving forward, right? So it's only been 1.5, but now we're having all this money for COVID coming in as well that we will need to spend the extra money. Do you think that it will reach 20 million? I don't think at one time, but in two months it could. Not at one time. Mm -hmm. And there's always a record, checks and balances, and documentation, correct? Yes, ma'am. And I can also, we can also incorporate on um, board updates of, of budget transfers on a quarterly, monthly basis if that also helps with the movement of items. But I just, I just want to clarify because the, the resolution doesn't, it says, it says an, an individual budget revision could be up to 20 million, the total is 50 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I thought you guys were all saying that 20 million would be the total over the three years. This is the start. Well, I'm just going to suggest this to move us along. So, I mean, if you want to propose a different level, you made your motion, so you'd have to, you'd have to amend your motion. Otherwise, let's just vote what's on the table. Great. I think we'll go ahead and move forward. I'm, I'm, com I'm comfortable with what's on the table. Great. Go ahead and move forward. Motion stands. Motion stands. Thank you. We can go ahead and vote. Sorry about that. We have a student, our student preferential vote. Please do the state. Yes. Great. And it passes four, one. We'll go ahead and move to item. 12.2, ratification approval of consultant agreement between Susan Unified School District and Deborah Amos. All right, 12.2. Can I please get a motion to move 12.2? I'll make a motion to approve 12.2. Second. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena. We have a second by board member Greer. Any discussion? But yeah, I have a question in terms of the consultant. Um, so when it says that she will be evaluating recommending changes, um, what what kind of improvements is she looking at? What is this, what is this proposal? We're looking at staffing, no options, and how to fix the script. Okay, great. And so when you say no options, are we looking at maybe? Healthy and more options, and trying to get to the point where we can have, uh, I call it the second chance offer, but when you have, let's just say it's a burger and the student doesn't want a burger, but they have another option for a full meal versus this is all we offer, just this one thing. Would you need more? What exactly is this consultant going to be doing for, for our district and for? So she will be assessing our in total our total nutrition services operation. Um, she started on Monday 
what she did as staff training um, for all of our nutrition service staff. We'll be incorporating safety training as well. Um, we will do proper food handling. Um, we will be assessing our meal distribution, our meal options, our menu options. Um, we will um, find ways to be more efficient with our operations as far as the presentation of our food and the selection of our food. Who selects our foods for our students? Uh, can you elaborate on right, that? Right, so, so we're hiring this, this consultant and you're saying, you know, so she's going to come to to help us, you know, with the selection of the food. So who is responsible for, for selecting the students' meals? Currently, right now, our director of nutrition services prepares our meals for the year. I mean, I mean, and so the consultant will work in collaboration with our directors so that we can um, have other ideas and see what other options are out there. Other options. So when, when you say other options, what do you mean by that? So right now we provide most of, almost all of our meals are pre-packaged. Um, so there's other options where we can actually prepare uh, meals on site versus having pre-packaged meals. Um, we can incorporate safe ways of having um, salad bar options, um, exploring more options on our menu, such as vegan options as well. Um, this, we just want to evolve. And there's uh, several options that I think in both collaboration with every in this, we can take our program to the next level. And um, I remember there was one year that um, when we had our previous uh, director, that there was taste testing. Yes, ma'am, the Lucella that will be incorporated. Yes, and we had the students choose. And, and, and so I, I don't know what the high school is, but sometimes they, they don't eat because they don't like the food. And so I would, would really like their, their input. And if you think that's going to happen, that's great. Thank you. Yes, we have a comment by our school, um, I'm sorry, by uh, our school, rep our student representative, Ms. Anna. Um, I know that someone did in fact visit us and asked what we would like as like um, students. They asked what kind of meals we would like in pre uh, preparation for the school year. Um, so I think we also have our comments on that. Thank you for that. We have the board member vote. Um, Mr. Malik, I think it's great that um, we're considering bringing on a consultant as an outside resource to evaluate our program. Um, I think the piece that might be missing in this document, which is spurring my colleagues' questions, is what are the specific goals or intentions around, <coughs> around the contracting and consultant? So um, I uh, speaking as, as one, voice, one vote, I would like to see uh, a little more detail in the scope um, going beyond you know, management advice on the nutritional services program. I'd like to see some goals and examples of activities of what this consultant is proposing to do. The clarification is, is, the, is this something that you would like moving forward? I would like to see that. Um, incorporated as an addendum to this this agreement that the scope of service be include more detail in terms of functional areas if it's menu planning if it's um, fresh food options um, those types of broad yet defined categories. Okay. And Dr. Bo, I just wanted to clarify: is that a motion to amend the original motion to approve this? this uh, action before the board? Yes, Mr. Vegas. Um, how should I voice that? It, it, I, and I wanted to clarify, if you're making a motion to amend at this point, then you would need a second on the motion to amend. And then if the board approved the motion to amend, if there was a majority of board members, then that would be the, the motion that would be standing. And the original motion to approve uh, the, the action that had been recommended no longer be there. So I just want to clarify for, for your motion to amend, I just want to make sure it's it's clear what would be added to the current recommendation. Thank you. If you give me a moment to collect my thoughts, I can write it down and be able to state that for the record. Give me uh, one person, if you give me a moment to. Yes, for uh, uh, yes. I have for a, a question for Natasha. Also, uh, on, on Deborah, I most. Uh, what is her background? Or is she special? Is she specializes in, in menus or nutrition or? Uh, 
Yes, ma'am. She was formerly the director of our Katie Unified School District. Oh, wow. um, she actually hired and trained Stella, our former director. Oh, um, she actually, actually, all of the directors here, uh, with the exception of Maria, she actually trained them over the course of her career. So she is well versed. She can lead us all the nutrition services training in public state. Oh, okay. Good, good. I'm just going to say I'm a really big fan of Arcadian lunch menus. They're, they're known for really good. So now my challenge is to make sure we say that about Azusa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like to thank Carlos. Thank you for for um for interjecting um on this. And this is I'm just going to give that example right now. We we just had this happen. I, I I didn't know how to proceed. This is something that I just learned today. So thank you, um, board member Bo, for uh, for speaking on this behalf. I actually um one of the things that well well, well she's so collecting her thoughts um with the previous uh cabinet that we worked with at the beginning of our of, of my term <clears throat> was just that that and all of the contracts that come to the board with independent contractors should have these things we need to know you know what is the goal but what is the end goal what are they going to do and at the end, did they accomplish what they said they were going to do? We're going to pay them. Did, did it happen? And so this is one thing that I would like to bring back. Um, I know, Ms. Latosh Jamal, you were not here when the as board directed our cabinet to, to do this. And so I, I would like to bring this back um, so that way we, we are transparent, we are holding our consultants accountable um, and making sure that they follow through in what they said they were going to. But then I also think that it would be helpful that we knew, you know, where they came from or what other districts they served, you know, a little bit about their background, you know, what, what was the rationale behind, you know, hiring this person. That would be good for us to know also. And on top of that, um, one of the things that we have said before as well is, you know, did we hire her? Did we have an RP go out? And did we have other contractors? And this is just in general, not just this one. Did we have other contractors bid for, for, you know, what were their qualifications, right? Or did we just call her up or call this consultant up and say, hey, we have this going on. Do you want to come and, you know, I want to be able to have equity and transparency here in our district. And I think it would be really, really important for us. Um, and it just so happens that, um, it, you know, this is a good example that we have these RFPs for our consultants to be able to go ahead and bid for, for these um, jobs that we are giving um, these individuals that are going to come service our, our district. Typically, for consultant services, you wouldn't do R. No, what would you know? You would you uh, typically, if um, just for the service or the need of the district, you reach out to the entity or the um, organization. Um, if there's other companies, you could get uh, two proposals or quotes if that's the desire, but that is not a requirement. So that's something that um, I know that we in our previous uh, meetings, we as the board had asked Cabinet to do um, for consultants, and so I. Didn't yeah. Well, I'll say that the, there are conversations that we had I mean, a couple, couple of years ago where we, we discussed some of this. I I think what's most important from, from this is, yeah, when, when we have a consultant just clearly communicating what the expectations are, what the, what the desired outcomes are, and, and ensure that there is one of those success indicators so we can determine that those that came and, and were here to do a job, that they were successful in the, the job that they did. So, so adding greater levels of clarity Generally, I think it's a good idea. We did discuss that in the past and, and we have come away from that. So if we can reevaluate how to, how to bring that back into the mix, it would be helpful. Um, I do think that it is, it is a good idea for us to bid for, for, um, for some of our, our, our vendors, but I don't, I don't know that it's always appropriate across the board um, to, to, to bid for, for vendors. I think that there are, there are, when we were having some of those, some of the conversations, I want to say we were talking about like something. I, I'm, I'm mistaken because it, it was a, a while ago, but it might have been some of the construction projects that we were looking at with uh, measure with some of our bond money. So, so because of 
this, this I wonder if this is different than, I would imagine this is different than that. Um, so maybe we just make sure we add a layer of thoughtfulness. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we don't already, but that we ensure that there are layers of thoughtfulness that are, that are there when we determine if we need to uh, put out a bid and, and we have multiple kind of bidders for, for different things that we're working on, or if it's more most appropriate to, to just contact a particular agency. That could just be conveyed to us, right? But no, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I don't think. I don't think that that wasn't. I. It appears that that was followed in this instance. So in this instance, I, it would not make me. I. I don't feel any less comfortable because I don't have proof that there wasn't a bid for this. There could be other things. If there were other items that we were discussing, I. I, I might not say the same thing. But in this particular item, I'm. I'm not concerned that that we don't have multiple uh, bids for this. Be just case by. Yeah. Council President, I'd like to propose an amended motion to approve the contract of 12.2 to for the agreement to include a an addendum that states a more detailed scope of work, including but not limited to um, management advice around fresh food options and menu planning. Can we get a motion to approve the addendum? Well, I'll, se I'll second. I will second her amended motion. Oh, mm -hmm. motion. No so matter. now we vote on. Okay. What's that, Buster? Mr. Hurst, the second amendment. Yeah. So to repeat my. Motion to uh, propose amended motion to approve the contract with Deborah, Deborah Amos, including for the agreement to include an addendum to the agreement to include, <clears throat> but not limited to, a detailed scope of work for uh, fresh food options and menu planning. And it's accepted by the chair. We have a second by Cruz and Salas. We can go ahead and cast our vote. So I reckon, is this, is this sorry, a, do you want more discussion? No, no, no. I just want to clarify. Is this a, this is an amendment to the motion, or this is a substitution? Or a, a substitution? What I and I'll just jump in there. What I understand to this is an amendment to the original motion. The original main motion was to approve the consultant agreement as it is currently written. Um, I understand Dr. Bo's amendment to add a provision in that consultant agreement that requires for the um, examination of healthy food options. So it'd be effectively approving the consultant agreement, but adding that language in. So I just want to recommend that we take a voice vote on this motion so that when we take a motion on the actual motion, the main motion, we can record it in the system. And I have a question for, for Carlos. Um, would, would we need to take another vote when we, when we do an uh, the the first the first the first there's going to be a vote on the amended motion, whether or not that's going to become the main motion before the board. Um, and it seems a little anticlimactic, but then the if, if that uh, amendment passes, then you now have an amended motion before you. The main motion, which was consideration of the consultant agreement, that goes away. And then Dr. Bowe's motion would be the motion before the board, and the board could take a second vote and whether or not that motion would pass. In, in theory, Dr. Bowe's motion could fail, and then everything reverts back to the original motion. Right, so, so the motion that, that the vote that we're taking now um, if we take it by hand, then whether it passes or it doesn't, and then what I would do is then bring it back during this meeting right now. And vote. That's correct. Then you would vote on the amended motion. I don't know. Thank you, Carlos. But we're going to do a hand vote for this one. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, bring it back. Well, I've already, Carlos, I've already amended the motion with with um, Dr. Bo's amendment in there so that it could be one vote. That's the way the system works. We amend the motion, which is the consultant agreement, to the vote. So we just need to have, recall Dr. Bo's motion. Um, board member uh, 
Cruz Gonzalez's second and vote. Okay, and then, then at that point, for my read is that the amended motion would now become the main motion. And I don't know if the system allows you to have a second vote. I, I agree, it seems redundant, but not. first, they will not. Okay, so, so is there, go ahead. Second, I would be creating a second vote after the fact in minutes. This system will not let me do that. It's either we vote on the first one or we amend it with Dr. Bo's suggestions and we vote on that. So basically the, 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 the addendum added, now what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll do a hand vote, not a computer vote, and then I will bring it back, right, with her, her added um, amendment, and that's what we'll vote on. Yes. And that's okay for me to add those two minutes after the fact, because it won't be on record of this, of this meeting right now. I think that might be the only solution because we're having uh, trouble with the system allowing us to track exactly what we're doing. So we're gonna have to write that one in later and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. So we have um, a first by card number Bo, and we have a second by Cruz Gonzalez. Um, it is recommended that the Board of Education ratify a proof consult agreement between AUSD and David Thomas with the amended motion to include an addendum. And we're going to go ahead and take a hand vote. Board Member Cruz Gonzalez? Yes. Board Member Greer? Yes. Board Member Rodriguez Pena? Yes. And Bo? Yes. I say yes, so it passes 5 0. And now I'm bringing it back. Correct? Correct. Now you're calling the question on the main motion, which now is uh, Dr. Bill's amended motion. Calling the question, would say? Yes, which was you're calling the matter to vote. So how would I say? Uh, there would need to be a, a motion to start that process. Okay. Is there a motion? The motion is already on the floor for a so now we just, I, I call for the vote. I call for, I call the question. Okay. Well, no, I don't want to do that because I don't want to vote on that. But you can just call for a vote now because okay. the motion is on the floor. So now I'm calling the matter to vote. Okay. And so now we, we vote electronically. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Passes 5-0. Moving on to 13.1. We have 2020-2021. Academic achievement results. This is an info item. We have Ms. Janet A. Bryan. Good evening. Good evening, President Ariana and board members, uh, Ms. Ortega, cabinet. Uh, what a pleasure to be here in person uh, after a year and a half of presenting through Zoom. So it's nice to truly see you all this evening. I'm going to be reporting on the results of our 2021 state assessment. Uh, I'm going to start to take you back in time a little bit. If you go back to 2019, COVID pandemic hit us, and uh, we are all on the stay-at-home order, and the California State Board of Education waived the state assessments, which are the SBAC and the CAST and the, uh, the tests that we use annually um, for accountability purposes. And then in 2021, we found ourselves continuing to be in the pandemic. And the state board was uh, able to provide flexibilities to districts last spring, because many districts were across the state in many different places. Uh, many still in distance learning, some slowly entering hybrid formats, other small rural areas were able to go back in person. And so the state really determined that districts would need to decide what was most feasible for their communities and their students. 
And so they developed some options from which uh, all districts could select. And um, it included using district developed assessments that were aligned to the Common Core State Standard that were available to students in grades three through eight and 11. And they could be individually reported to parents and families. So here in AOSD, we have a very strong system of district-wide common formative assessment for all of our students in language arts and in math. So the most feasible option for us was to use these results for the accountability purposes for the 2021 state assessment. And so while the data I present tonight from our local assessments really supports us in, in understanding where our students are, it is very important to note that this is just one small snapshot that helps us determine where our students are as we begin to make decisions and drive instruction. It gives us data for the accountability purposes, but our teachers, our schools are using multiple measures to really precisely determine where our students are and how to meet those needs. We will continue to have common formative assessments. Uh, teachers can look back on all of the assessments last year. And um, as students return to school this, this fall, we immediately began to do diagnostic assessments in language arts and math with our students so that we, again, had multiple points of data to drive instruction. So tonight the focus is just sharing one quick snapshot that will be used to report in our school accountability report cards that will be um, presented and to the public in February. So um, I'd like to go ahead and, and share some of the results of the formative assessments tonight that we are using for 2021 accountability purposes. These are language arts results for students in grades three through eight and 11. You can see 32% of the students uh, at this assessment were meeting or exceeding the standard. And this graph also shows you the full range of performance levels. The next slide uh, shows you a different view, uh, disaggregating by grade level. And if Dr. Mitchell could roll it up just a little bit more, you'll be able to see at the bottom of that graph, thank you, Dr. Mitchell, uh, the, the grade levels uh, by grade. The next slide, shows the view by our student groups and a little bit higher. And then the bottom can show you the groups that we were able to disaggregate by. And then the following slide gives you yet another view of the data by our school sites. Next, let's look at the mathematics results. Overall, we uh, had 18% of students meeting or exceeding standards on the assessment. Um, and then again, reflecting all of the performance levels on this circle graph on this slide. The following page, again, as we did with the language arts, we were able to look by grade level. And the next slide can provide us a snapshot by our student group. And the final graph, again, provides our, our school level results. As a quick reminder, these results are for students, um, not all students in the district, while all students do take our common formative assessments. Uh, if for the purposes of this reporting, this is just students in grades three through six for elementary schools, our seventh and eighth graders in our middle school, and then our, only our 11th graders for high school. And again, I can't emphasize more how important it is for um, our own uses, not the accountability purposes, but rather our own purposes to use this as only one snapshot. And indeed, we have multiple points of data that we use to drive instruction, understand our students, and develop plans for accelerating learning this year. So in the final slide, you'll see an image of. We, uh, check, we'll go, can we ask questions through each slide, if possible, please? This is my last slide. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to I, I stop now. No, I can't stop. Okay. So 
So parent and family uh, information letters accompany individual reports that were uh, printed from Illuminate, which is our, our district data and assessment system. And this letter described the assessments, uh, provided descriptions of the performance levels and percentages of the scores, and additionally outlined the standards that were assessed. And this was mailed home in uh, early, early June of 2021. Um, this data, along with uh, many other measures was used also to develop and, and look at uh, what we needed to do in, in the way of meeting student needs in our 21-22 LCAP. And as I stand before you today, and I'm going to say that again, as I stand before you today, the State Board of Education has said that we will be returning to the traditional SBAC, a little slightly shortened version in ELA and math, but we will be using the regular state assessments this spring. Um, and that again includes SBAC and ELA and math, the CAST, which is the California Science Test, uh, and then also our CAA, which is the California Alternative Assessment, which is for our, our students who have that identified as an assessment method in their IEP. So uh, district wide will continue to use uh, multiple data as we make instructional instructional decisions this year for our students. So thank you very much. And I can take some questions. Here. Thank you for your presentation there, Board Member Greer. Yeah, I thank you. I, I hear how, you know, as, as we look at this, we continue to say that this is this is but one data point or data piece. And that there, there are multiple things for us to look at. Um, I, I do want to be careful though to not move too quickly past this and what and and what we are able to gather from this mm -hmm. data because there there are there are pieces as I as I look at some of the some of this data and, and some of the graph there are pieces that are concerning and, I, and so I so I think let, let me be careful not to this is not a question that I'm posing to you individually I, maybe I'm posing to us all collectively as 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 we look at this what what does what what does this what is what does this communicate for us as a, in, in, about what you know we, we need you know how, how how do we look at at some of these numbers um, and some of the numbers are low. How do we, what, looking at these numbers, how do we? It's instead of in, instead of us saying that uh, that there are other data pieces, which I understand that there are. What do we do with this with, with these, these this piece of information? Typically, these assessments are what we call common formative, and these are assessments that we use to be able to gauge our instruction. Um, this, the scores are not typical of what our district assessments normally are in, in you know, in-person circumstances. So these were assessments that were taken, um, could have been online, could have been at home, right? Um, and so we were definitely in a, in a state of transition. Um, I think what it tells us is that um, we can use that um, in conjunction um, with, you know, uh, our diagnostic assessments to see, you know, teachers can take a look to see where students were before um, last year, and they can also take a look at where they are uh, with their diagnostic assessments to, to, get, a, to get a bigger picture. Um, so, again, these are really assessments that we don't use in a summative way. We use them to kind of gauge exactly where students are and where we need to go. In many cases with these assessments, there's a rubric, right? And so when the teachers are scoring these assessments, there are multiple measures within that as well. And so um, that's that's just, it's a way for teachers to be able to look at those, you know, for example, mathematics problems for, for example, writing rubric, and then determine what are some of the trends that they see overall that students need to work on, as well as what they would need to do individually um, for students. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, so can you explain to me, um, one, why we chose our local assessment? I know we also administer iReady, right? So what, why was the decision made to use our local assessment versus iReady? So um, at the time, we did not purchase iReady for all students. We okay. did that just for this year. And iReady only is for grades K through eight as well. So. Those are the factors that led us to part of the decision as we made to, to discuss the options that were most feasible. Mm -hmm. And actually, I should have started by, by thanking you for having this having this presented publicly as required by the state waiver that, that we got that we presented publicly. So 
I appreciate that. Um, so that so that was my first question, and then my my next question is really around. Um, so you say that these are these are formative assessments, right? They're not benchmark tests. So can you explain to us um, how, in what way do we use them differently that makes them a formative assessment versus what I, I think on its surface could look like, uh, you know, a, a common a common benchmark, a common benchmark assessment that we give across the district. I can start and then you can add. <laughs> so one of the things that make these formative assessments is that the teachers can turn around and use this data immediately within their classrooms to adjust instruction. When we look at some of the assessments, like the SVAC, the students just take it once. And when we get the scores back, the students are out of the, that teacher's classroom. So it's some of them that they don't have a way to then adjust with those particular students. That they were working with before, and so that's one of the big differences with um, with these formative assessments that we use in our district compared to to some of the some of the assessments. The other thing I like to add is that these assessments are are written to be um, of a similar quality, rigor, uh, task that students would see on the smart balance assessment. We want to be able to give students that practice. So we'll see what kind of task those would look like as well. And so there may be where um, that maybe it, maybe a student isn't quite ready and hasn't mastered those uh, those standards quite yet. But it's a it's a great way for teachers to be able to um, you know take a look to see what are some of those areas um, in terms of again writing performance tasks problem solving. So, 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 yeah. so for clarity, are you saying that? If I'm a if I'm a fourth grade student, I am taking this assessment, and, and this this is an assessment for what I am to to have learned by the end of my fourth grade year, and so so I have more learning to do throughout the course of the year. Um, so then we would see these numbers increase, or or is this based off of of what a student should current where a student should currently be at that. Point in their school. It's based on what the students should be at that point. Um, this is what we would expect them to know. And so, this, you know, an assessment is able to tell us, you know, to what extent are they able to, you know, uh, to show proficiency or mastery on those standards. So, then going back to my question, um, so I appreciate you differentiating, although I think what you just described to me could also be used to describe a, a benchmark test that you gave throughout the year. So, um, uh, thank you for clarifying how it's used. So, can you just give me a sense in terms of, like, let's say the kids take this test, right? They take a common formative assessment. What what happens with that, and what's the turnaround time, and who ends up looking at it, and what time frame? Great question. Um, so, we have our professional learning communities that are are set up at our school site. Uh, typically, the student or the teachers will look at the data. Um, it can be twice a month or once a month. It just depends on how they set it up. If they're looking at language arts, for example, sometimes they're looking at the mathematics um, when they have assessments. And so um, we do uh, we do data protocols with our principals. We model different ways to be able to do protocols to look at some of that data. Um, teachers would work together in um, a, a kind of a plan, do, study, act model. So they would look at the assessments. Um, they would disaggregate the results. And really talk about what are some of the trends and maybe I'm looking at my class and I'm seeing uh, that students had some success on a specific standard and maybe um, Mr. Ortega is saying oh gosh my students you know um, maybe didn't do as well in that standard what were some of the strategies that you used when you were teaching that so it's an opportunity for in a professional learning community to really talk about what are some of the strategies that we can use to be able to um, you know assist our students to um, meet those standards. So we do this in a professional learning community. The teachers have opportunities to be able to take a look at assessment results, have discussions around um, best practice, and then be able to do any, um, you know, again, any additional reteaching. So how often do we give, do we do formative assessments? Let's say with language arts. Yes, so we have three assessments in language arts and math that we do as a district. However, teachers also do their own common form of assessments that they're doing as well. Uh, this is just a way for us as a district to be able to say this is something that we do with uh, with all of our grades and our classes, but certainly um, teachers are also doing this on a, a regular basis as well. And not only just common form of assessments, but really taking a look at student work as well. Okay, and then my, my final, um, I guess, request would be, because I don't think you have this here, 
Um, I, I really like to understand, and I understand that it could be, I mean, if you're looking at it like great, great to great comparison, it may be different cohort or if, you know, from like a third grade to grade. I'd like to understand how this, um, how these these results compare to previous years, right? Just trying to understand the effect of the pandemic that, that, that it's had on our students. Um, and so along those same lines, I would really, I, I really think it's really important for us at the board level to understand what are the, if we're, if we're administering diagnostic tests, right, to bring back a summary of that data so we can understand what, really where we see and aggregate our students are in terms of having been in distance learning for a year plus, and then, you know, this modified approach at the end of last year. So again, that's a, that's a request for, I guess, in the future, not, you know, in the near future, um, just to understand and really publicly have a conversation about where we are post kind of, or continuing. Yep, certainly. And, and the other thing, too, is that we continually um, take a look at the assessments. Um, we're currently doing that work actually right now with um, our uh, the work that we're doing with our preschool, um, the third grade uh, collaboration. Um, something that we have been doing, for example, is uh, doing an analysis of uh, the standards. For example, algebra, algebra and operations. Um, what are some of those uh, standards that we see um, uh, to help us with not only um, coherence among the grade levels, uh, but really taking a look at uh, an analysis of our of our assessments and to determine um, can we make them stronger and clearer, right? So sometimes our assessments, um, they will change um, year after year because we're just trying to improve. We're trying to, you know, trying to, to really um, create a system of assessment that's really going to give us the data that we need. But I don't disagree. Yeah, being able to give you some, you know, some uh, information on, you know, uh, what those assessment results are. So do that. Go ahead, board member. Okay. Uh, just, just one question. You, you, you talked about, um, how, how PLCs play, are, are, are utilized it with this information where you, you can have um, you know, teach different instructors who are comparing some of the hows and what's and, and commonalities. Does that happen across site as well? Because as I look at some of the numbers um, that, that are displayed here, and it shows differences at, at, at various sites. Does that happen across the site or, or are you talking about PSP, a local PLC? Does it happen across the district or? Across the district, so from school, yes, uh, one school to another. Uh, typically, with our uh, our PLCs, they do happen at the school sites, um, by grade level, by content area. Um, but it's not uncommon that uh, we've had uh, professional learning opportunities where, for example, we'll have high school uh, integrated one teachers get together and you know do some protocols around um, student work or analyzing some of the assessment results. But typically, it really is done um, at those individual sites. And we have board member both. Hi, Dr. Brian. I have a couple of uh, structural questions and then a strategic question. Um, in looking at this year's with the common form assessment data that you presented, can you share with us the assessment window? The May 1 to May 20th? Yeah. The, Did everyone take it during the same three-week period? Yeah, we do create windows for our district assessments and have deadlines. So if this was in the spring for spring assessments. Yeah. And um, can you share with us the participation rate? I do not have that data right offhand. I can get that for you and report it back. Thank you. And then my my kind of strategic question on the data is um, if we're assuming then that the <clears throat> assessments were administered earlier in the spring, um, were these results incorporated or did they inform the LCAP, our current LCAP? Yes, actually, they all of these assessments were completed uh, by the end of May and and you know, in the last week of school there, in the first week of June, we were able to then get the data ready to report. And so, um, yes, we were able to, to look at these as one of, one of the pieces that is in our LCAP as a measure of our students' achievement. We combine this with our, our SBAC scores that we get uh, from this coming spring, if that plan goes ahead as the state board intends. Thank you. Board member Greer. Just for clarity, you said uh, you originally said that, that the dip, one of the differences with this data is that the students are, are currently in their classrooms, and so there's the, the opportunity to to make adjustments in, in real time. But you, so is that the case? Or within that, you said that these assessments took place in May, in May last, last So these this assessment took place last spring, and so some of our students may have taken this 
in the hybrid mode and were happened to be in their site. Some were right. perhaps in a living room with three other siblings around them doing class. Another was in their room by themselves logging in. Um, so there were multiple factors that went into right. these results, which is one of the big reasons we were not alone in the challenges. And thus the board's the state board's decision to just create some flexibility and and just give to get, give districts an ability to get a snapshot of achievement. That makes sense. Can you clarify what you meant when you were saying how this data is used in real time for our instructors? I, I think I heard you say that in real so, time for instructors to make uh, adjustments. Yeah, and, and I think what I was referencing was just all of our common formative assessments that Dr. Mitchell men mentioned that we use ongoing throughout the year. Our teachers can, the students take this assessment in Illuminate, our system, and the results are there and can be disaggregated within that. And then the teachers can use this right away after they get the results. For example, they, and we'll use the diagnostic as an example. They've got these results and now they're meeting and saying, okay, here's, here's where this student is and here's where this student is. And when I create small groups, I'm gonna group this way so I can address the needs of this and they can use them in ongoing instruction right now. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anybody else have any other comments? Question? Um, as you just said right now, I was going to ask that question. Um, how the teachers use this, you know, this data in real time, you know, for example, I'm, I'm thank you for, for presenting and sharing this. One thing that, um, um, what interventions um, the teachers use, do principals put, you know, uh, when they have, I, I'm looking at the scores here and, and we're, we're really low. And so what interventions are we doing, right? If they're using it in real time, what are we doing to be able to go ahead and put in place to, to assist with, you know, with uh, these students to go ahead and, and they're like nearly met. Mm -hmm. How can we push them over the threshold, right, to, to, to meet those standards? Right. I think if we, if we look at this from a teacher and a site perspective, if I'm a teacher, I'm going to take these previous year's results, and I'm going to look at them, and then I'm going to want to see where are my students right now, and then I'm going to pull that diagnostic assessment that I just gave, and then I'm going to begin to develop uh, ways to support those students. And sometimes those interventions will be within the class. For example, if I see a, a student has a, a struggle in reading, I'm going to scaffold and create ways to help that student access the text, but also then maybe create some opportunities for that student to improve in their reading skills so that they're not losing the content. We don't want to go backwards and teach the past. We don't want to, we don't want to remediate our students and say, oh, they're not at grade level. Let's just reteach the past. We don't want to do that. What we do know is we want to support them in accessing current grade level standards, supporting them in accessing things, for example, like I said, reading, but and also providing opportunities to accelerate and to touch up on the specific things that they're struggling with. And our diagnostics are one of the one of the powerful ways we can do that because it breaks down the real details as to why a student maybe isn't quite uh, reading, for example, at, at the level we hope they were at this point in time. What percent of the of the teachers are are using this this data that you this data or all of our formative assessment data? I'm all of the formative assessment. Um, hundred percent. We give diagnostics. This is just third through eighth and eleventh, but we give formative assessments and diagnostics to kindergarten through twelfth graders. So every teacher has access to that data. One other thing. One little question. Uh, yes, board member, we're okay. going to and we'll have. No, I have a question. So, um, when if these students took this test last year, we'll say they're third graders, now they're fourth graders. Uh, I'm not sure the process here, but okay. So, the test scores go into their pupil file, or how do the teachers that didn't have these kids last year get these, you know, uh, results so they can have the intervention? or work extra with the child math reading or whatever? How do they get these in their hand now with these are fine yeah. kids? Good, good question. One of the great things about Illuminate is a teacher, when he, he or she gets a student in his class, can go back and look at previous results for that student. They all have that program, the Illuminate program. Yes, where they can yes. And, and okay, so the second question, so 
how how will we guarantee that the teacher is doing just that? Well, well one of the things Dr. Mitchell just mentioned is through our PLC process, through the leadership of our principals and our district uh, instructional leaders that, that use that data as part of their their school process. For Dr. I, I totally understand the timing. You know that they may be at home and they and, and I, I totally understand um, because the scores that. Yeah, when I first saw them, they're horrible. I was not really happy about it, but I understand the situation. But that doesn't mean that we cannot continue to intervention them and to make up. Hopefully, next year we're going to see this. Is going to should actually should look totally different, better. I'm optimistic about that myself. Yes. One, one of the. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna. I was gonna say I want to thank you um, for bringing. Didn't you bring in somebody to help train the teachers on how to do accelerated learning? We did. Um, we brought in. Uh, thank you for that. We brought in um, two uh, just powerhouse experts on Monday. We brought in Dr. Nancy Akavan. Um, her specialty is she has a lot of specialties, but one is around literacy and small group instruction. And um, we're present, Ariana. She asked, "Well, how do we do that? What are the things we do?" That is one of the uh, the best strategies is to use uh, that small group instruction. Um, when you're in the professional learning community process, you, you look at the data and you well, first you ask yourself, what is it we want kids to don't be able to do? You identify that, right? And then you, you teach it, you do it, and then you determine to what extent the students are actually learning and mastering the standards. But the most important question and response to that is what do we do when they do and what do they do when they don't? And so this whole idea of learning acceleration is not about this you know, this constantly going back and, and this idea of remediation. As a matter of fact, um, both uh, Dr. Nancy Akavon and Dr. Douglas Fisher, who was our secondary uh, uh, presenter on Monday, uh, really advised against this idea and this notion of remediation. It is about learning acceleration. So um, making certain that we are providing our students with the great level material. And then what we need to do is be able to help, you know, the kids be able to access that. If we live in this, uh, this, this notion of remediation, um, it, the gap is going to be wider. And so that's why it is very, very important to be able to, um, to structure uh, small group instruction and really using those assessments to determine exactly what those students need. So I would say that that's, 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 a, that's a big focus for us this year. Um, and and uh, at another board meeting, we uh, will we'll be bringing back another um, a contract with uh, Dr. Akamon um, because we would like her to be able to come in and actually do some um, in-person coaching um, with the small group instruction with our teachers. I just want to say I really appreciate that because I think I see a lot of teachers defaulting to bring in like package programs, like let's test the kids in their reading and let's get them really. Good. And so I really appreciate that you're having a approach where you're focusing on strengthening the, the people power that we have, the teachers around the best and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 I probably want to thank you for all that. And I, I do have faith in you that, you know, and, and our staff, that things have changed just to let you know, you know, I'm like, no, so I'm talking about two folder, right? You know? <laughs> but I'm like, well, what am I saying? That's like, that's old school, right? But you have great programs at the USB. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Since uh, there's no more questions, I want to thank you for this presentation. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and move on to 13.2. Uh, our agenda is dual immersion program update. Well, good evening, board. Tonight, we would like to provide you with an update on our dual immersion program. Uh, we'd like to provide you an update on our enrollment, our investment in the program, our plan to build capacity, and next steps to continually improve the way in which we serve students and the community. So our current enrollment, we serve students in dual enrollment um, uh, for uh, dual immersion for PK through fifth grade at Longfellow, Hodge, and Valleydale. And we currently have 439 students. We have an LCAP budget that supports our DI program with a budget of over $2.2 million. And our LCAP actions and services denote the long-term advantages of bilingualism 
and dual language immersion programs on the achievement and reclassification of emerging bilingual students. We know that by increasing dual immersion program at our schools, our students will have the opportunity to develop balanced bilingualism and increase academic achievement. We've had a very successful and growing DI program that has resulted in uh, increased academic achievement of our students, particularly our emerging bilingual students as well. Um, we have um, local assessment data that show that our DI students are excelling. Um, as a matter of fact, they are outperforming um, other student groups. Uh, at the school reorganization meeting, uh, at the board meeting at the last one, um, we talked about a possible idea um, to have a uh, dual immersion school um, as you know as a possibility in the uh, school reorganization. Um, we look, we have plans to, again to continue our program, our very strong program, um, uh, as we as we have the students continue on through the sixth grade and middle school and high school as well. Um, want to talk a little bit about um, some of the changes that occurred. And so I'd like to turn it over to um, Mr. Rompio uh, to tell us a little bit about some of those class changes that we went through. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And in hopefully in the um, course of uh, what I present here, I will be able to speak to some of the comments that were uh, brought forth during uh, public comment. Uh, I see that the second bullet is 10 day counts and class changes. If to uh, the board's permission, I would like to uh, take a little further back and provide some context to um, how we got to where we are uh, with this uh, point right now. Uh, so, in the spring of 2021, we offered our temporary contract to emerge and future that both uh, Valleydale and Hodge a probationary contract with building positions at Valleydale Elementary, both uh, temporary contract uh, DI as teachers and an English only via um, temporary contract teacher took the probationary contract uh, positions. And uh, in effect, the staffing for DI at Valleydale was, uh, was satisfied. And we implemented the same approach at uh, Hodge Elementary, wherein we uh, um, we went first to our uh, temporary contract DI teachers um, and offered them a probationary contract. It looked promising to, to begin with. Uh, and then um, during the summer, one of the uh, teachers that we made an offer to uh, decided not to return for this upcoming year. Uh, we also looked at our temporary uh, teachers in the English only program to fill the uh, growing fifth grade class. And um, we did not find a, uh, a um, teacher within our ranks of teachers uh, for, for that position. Uh, we did do that during the spring. Um, and then we, um, uh, we went into the summer um, needing to fill these positions. So we did fly the positions on edge joint as we normally do um, and we did not find a quality candidate uh, we, um, there were there were some uh, issues with uh, we tried to work with the with the candidates on um, but some of those some of those issues were insurmountable um, and so we did make a difficult decision to um, uh, wait until the beginning of the school year to uh, evaluate our uh, and, and look at our enrollment. Uh, we are defining an enrollment um, district, and uh, we do uh, want to see whether or not, uh, in the course of the beginning of the year, and looking at our candidate counts, um, there would be a decline in enrollment at a school site that would yield a administrative transfer to build this need. Uh, however, our enrollment projections for the elementary site were pretty close to the actual enrollment at the elementary sites. And so we did not find a uh, teacher that possessed a B-class uh, credential that we could transfer to to uh, The option that did emerge as we did our analysis, uh, which is essentially our 10-day count, uh, was to combine two first grade uh, classes um, at Hodge 
and two secondary classes of select five uh, to fill the vacancies um, that, we, that we, we had in the fourth and fifth grade level. Uh, so by doing so, uh, we saw that the uh, two first grade classes could be combined. The class size would uh, it, uh, exceed the contractual maximum. Um, and the, the same uh, scenario played out in both first grade and second grade. Um, and so we, um, we then uh, interacted with the teachers uh, in accordance to the contract. So there's a provision in the contract that is 9.1.1 that states that, uh, that there could be uh, situations um, wherein the class size uh, could exceed the contractual class size maximum. And so there are a set of steps that we need to take in order to, um, to determine whether or not uh, um, this would be a suitable option. We, uh, I met well, along with the principal, uh, with the teachers. The teachers also had the, our AEA uh, Association President, Ms. Savella, in the meeting. Uh, we discussed the issue, the, the option, and ultimately uh, we, we landed on a solution that we have uh, with implement, wherein the uh, two first grade classes were combined uh, and the two second grade classes were combined. The teachers that were um, uh, that were part of the first and second grade team then went up to fourth and fifth grade level. Um, and then uh, we were able to do that. Um, I, I know that there are concerns and there's an ask for additional staff, which we've heard um, in our meeting with uh, with parents last week, uh, and those have not fallen on deaf ears. Uh, we are in conversations really trying to fill those positions, and um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to report back or that we've been able to fill those positions with additional support uh, to, to provide teachers. Thank you, Mr. Arfio. I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Norma Camacho. Norma is our director of multilingual program and categorical surgery. To talk a little bit about um, our plans in terms of building staff capacity and enrollment. Okay, so we continue to support and build capacity among our DI staff by offering professional learning opportunities. We are also looking to this year expand the Sobrato Early Academic Language Program which is otherwise known as SEAL. You'll often hear our preschool uh, staff refer to it in that way. Um, from our preschool and TKs to three of our elementary sites, which include Valleydale and Hodge, where our DI programs are ha uh, housed. So SEAL is an instructional model that emphasizes bilingualism, biliteracy, and multiculturalism, along with academic language and inquiry-based learning. It's a program that's highlighted in the California English Learner Roadmap as an effective model for English learners. We continue to support our DI teachers in earning a dual language certificate through Loyola Marymount. We have seven teachers currently who have earned their certificates by completing rigorous courses in Spanish linguistics, as well as academic Spanish and all of the different content areas. We continue our efforts to increase interest and enrollment in our program um, by promoting our program all year round, highlighting students and teachers on um, social media, through videos, um, also um, through the posting of banners and sending out um, mailers and, um, and at the new year. We also are going to be partnering with our California State Preschool Program to capture some of our youngest learners um, to invite them and their families into our dual immersion program. As Dr. Mitchell shared earlier, our, our data for English learners who are participating in the DI program for about four to five years indicate that the ELs in our DI program are actually outperforming our EL students who are in a structured English immersion program. Even through the pandemic, and distance learning. So we do continue to uh, support our and 
want to increase our students who are earning the seal of biliteracy um, and also recognizing our younger students who have a second language, um, a home language, and we want to celebrate that students bring that asset into our schools by recognizing them with our own district bilingual service award and um, biliteracy certificate. Can I add something to that? That's completely unscripted, but <clears throat> today I was uh, at Hodge um, visiting and uh, happened to bump into a teacher uh, who's in the dual immersion program. Uh, and again, I'm prompted through just normal conversation. Uh, she mentioned how excited she was about the SEAL training. Um, and the comment that really stuck to me was that um, that she sees how beautifully it fits to what we've been working on. And it's not contrary or against. And so she was very, very excited about that. So I just want to, that just happened today. Um, and just to add to that, um, you Kind of summarize here. Um, we met with Hodge parents uh, last week for families who were affected by the classroom changes. And the parents had an opportunity to share their concerns. And as a result, we are working on improving our communication, providing additional classroom support, and improved parent involvement. Um, Ed Services and uh, HR have a meeting next week to begin staffing planning. And as we solidify our plans, we will be happy to share that with our DI community and the board. Do you have any comments? Um, I, I just have a question. Yes. Okay. Remember, so one. first can you just, I mean, I think, um, I just want clarity <laughs> around the staffing changes to start off with. So I know you talked about waiting for the committee counts, but so in, so what what was the impact? And so what did, what did those classrooms look like on the first year of class? So what did the fourth, so I get you, you talked about, we, we already heard first and second each had about there's two classes with 15 kids. Now what did fourth, what did fourth and fifth look like for the dual immersion program? I'm, I'm not looking at my the factual numbers, but I believe they were um, high 20s for, for fourth and um, a, a similar number that for the fifth grade class. But I'm not talking about enrollment, I'm, I'm not talking about enrollment, I'm talking about what do those classrooms look like? Yeah. So the kids went to school. What what happened with those students? Okay, uh, so they started off the year the school year with uh, or our intention was to start off the school year with a substitute teacher. Um, we um, have experience the uh, shortage in substitutes, um, and so um, my understanding that one of those classes uh, did have a substitute to start off the year, uh, and then. Fourth grade class, I believe third grade teachers um, had divided the class, uh, the fourth grade class, and were essentially splitting the, the, the fourth graders um, amongst the teachers uh, who had those students in the third grade. So we had two, three, four combos, and then a fifth grade. Is that what it looked like when the school year started? So if you're saying the fourth graders were with the third grade teacher, the, mm -hmm. So you had third graders and fourth graders in, the same, in, in, a, in two different classrooms, and then you had fifth grade class. Yeah, I, I did two, three, four combos to start off the year because there, there wasn't a substitute uh, to place in, in, in the fourth grade class. So, so my question is, what, what are we going to do to ensure that we are fully staffed for next year? And I mean, I guess I'm including the first grade, second grade, and then the upper so, like Dr. Mitchell stated, I mean, we um, we've already started a conversation as far as the what the, having the conversation, having the, the the plan, starting a a campaign earlier um, than than we did last year uh, to cap the plan. Dr. Mitchell, do you want to add anything? I think the other thing, aside from taking a look at um, teachers that we have within our district who um, might be interested in our program. Um, is also um, uh, reaching out to other networks. Um, there are other there are universities that uh, have you know programs, um, and so how might we be able to establish some networks um, to, to recruit uh, qualified candidates? So have we, do we? So I know I heard you say that you're recruiting through our our temporary teachers. Was there any effort to recruit any of our BPAC teachers who are not temporary teachers? 
So I, I did give that some thought. Um, and so while we do have some B five teachers that are not uh, currently teaching in the um, dual immersion program, uh, we uh, there was a point in the summer where we uh, had to make a difficult decision um, because the teachers who we had um, who have B class are already in school assigned to school sites throughout the, the district that would have been impacted by pulling those teachers out to um, place them in a uh, program that um, they, during the summer, may not be prepared to um, start the school year off. Um, so uh, we have, in the past, have experienced significant declining enrollment. Um, and in some cases, we've had some large numbers of teachers who had moved from one class or from one school to another. Uh, so, so we were, we were, um, in fact, that may be a, a less disruptive less disruptive option for us to pursue. So I guess I, what I'm asking is not, I, and I appreciate you saying not wanting to do this in the summer, right? But thinking about long-term, right? Thinking about we know we need a staff. We know we have uh, many teachers in our district who may or may not be interested, but have we thought about recruiting early on some of these teachers if, if they have the skill set and the desire to be, to be in that program? Yes, of course. So we, we've done it or we're no, going no. to do it? We're looking forward, yes, we're, of course, we're looking to begin the recruitment process to see if there are uh, teachers interested in um, the program who are raised to the SAP class. And then my, I know I'm kind of talking, I'm sorry. And then my last question just around teacher recruitment then is around the middle school. So these kids are going from fifth grade to sixth grade, right? So what kind of plan are we putting into place to make sure that, that we have now single subject credential teachers who can teach in these primary in, in Spanish? Yeah, and that process does have to start early as well. Um, and so uh, it will be the same process, right? So what we need to do, and I think what we will have in middle school, it would be two classes um, that they the students would take in Spanish. And so it's a matter of taking a look to see, um, you know, who who are the available staff that would want to do this, and that um, we feel would be a good fit for that, and starting that conversation now. We have a question by Board Member Bo. I'm just a, a kind of a truly blow up the box, out of the box idea to think about in terms of teacher recruitment. Um, perhaps you could look into the feasibility of recruiting out of state teachers, especially in states with um, high Spanish speaking populations and successful dual language programs like Arizona and Texas. I've been really thinking creatively about identifying prospective teachers early and determining what kind of credential support they would need to become certified in California as well as Relocation and incentive support. Yes, I like that idea. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. We have a question by Board Member Greer. So this this question may be rephrasing. I may be rephrasing some of uh, uh, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez's question. Um, as as we, I, I we got to a point in the summer, or not even the summer, we got to the point as the school year started where we realized where we found ourselves in. And so we pivoted and we made, we made adjustments to, to, um, to, to ensure that the, 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 the program could, you know, could withstand a, a, a staffing shortage that, that, that we encountered. Um, so so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm, great, I'm grateful for the fact that we, we, we saw and, and we made the adjustments. And then to take it even further, parents communicated concerns. We had meetings with parents. And now we're, we're even still saying like we're making those adjustments. And we're making those, those pivots in real time to address the concern. That's all great. I love that. As we reflect back, as we reflect back on this past year, do we look back and do we see things that we didn't do that we should have done? The reason, and I, and I, and I asked that question not to, to kind of, you know, just, just spend time and dwell on that, but to use that to reflect on how, how we respond to this in the future, one, but also because if we have parents who are communicating a, a lack of trust or, or, or that they're saying that confidence was, has been diminished as a result of how things played out, I think it's important for us to acknowledge and, and it, it, it acknowledge if that's the case, if there, if there are things that we didn't do that we should have done or that we could have done, that we acknowledge that as a step toward saying, hey, y'all, we, we, we 
though we didn't, we see this and we acknowledge and we recognize that we didn't. And, and as we move forward, these are the things that we're going to put in, to put in place. Yes, of course. And um, I'm glad you, you, you phrased it the way you did, um, Board Member Drew. And I apologize for not um, saying this uh, earlier. I do acknowledge that there are definite areas for, for improvement. And I'd like to think of myself as a reflective practitioner. And um, and I have, I have identified areas and missteps that uh, could have been done um, uh, differently to, to not have, maybe to have prevented this from, 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 from happening. Um, there are, um, I, and, and I only say, you know, there's this, this, this next statement, just to provide some context in, in a larger sense that we have been experiencing extreme shortages and um, in, in, in positions at all levels. And it was, there was a, um, and maybe I didn't read the TV as as, as, as good as I could have, um, but what I what I see now, hindsight being 2020, is that um, some of these some of the the, the pool size of, of folks who have applied that was an indicator that we, we were we were in in in, in, in dangerous waters that maybe we should have started we actually not maybe we should have started uh, a lot earlier. Uh, so I do recognize that, and so that's why uh, we are starting this process for this next year for 22 and 23 um in the next couple of weeks for that so that we're not putting ourselves in, in this position and, and what i'd like to say is and i want to thank you cabinet and superintendent for meeting with the parents because they were very gracious that you met with them and at least explained to them the situation because as we know your transparency is so important in our district and with our, our community and our parents and once they knew what was happening and you know, we're going to work on making it better or, or fixing the problem. They have more trust in our district. And, and I think that was really great. And I really appreciate that. I have one, one last question. I, I hear the conversation. First of all, yes, thank you for meeting with the parents. Dual immersion is, is, is a great asset that we have in, in our district. And I truly believe in dual immersion, dual immersion and learning from these you know, hiccups that, that are happening and putting into motion um, what, uh, being proactive and putting into motion what can um, uh, make this program, you know, better for our students uh, is really important. One of the things that I heard tonight was um, additional staff. So does that mean that, that our dual immersion classes and that will they be receiving? Will they will they be having an aid? Um, is, is that what it means? I just want clarification on that. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll start off by by um, uh, addressing addressing that question. So one of the um, as we and I'm going to widen the scope a little so that we I can share with the Board of Education that um, our staffing shortages are also in the area of our substitutes, and then when we had to. Uh, or quarantine um, to create some um, establishment. So we actually had passed a pretty wide net part of the school year even starting for, for a set of teaching positions uh, that were more, more, more overlapped. Uh, and so we, um, in the process of identifying and, and going through that, a lot of the folks that applied um, have either been picked up or uh, didn't, are, are no longer interested. But there are a couple of folks who I interviewed um, last week uh, who um, are showing promise that I may be able to offer them a position um, and have them start at hard, not as a as a um, teacher's aide, but as a as an actual teacher to provide uh, full out intervention support um, for for the site. Um, so, so that's that's something that we are um, we're in our final stages in the HR onboarding process that may materialize as, as early as next week. Great. So that, that would be for the entire school site? Or are you saying that's for the dual immersion program? The position would be for the entire school site to provide rover support, but the, um, the, the, the intervention could be targeted at, uh, for, the, for the intervention, I'm sorry, for the dual immersion program. So let me ask another question. Um, you know, I asked, I asked as a request for the board member to, to step clarity about how many of our classrooms are overstaffed right now. And you let me know what the right, how many do we have just deployed? 
are overstaffed or above I mean, over capacity? over capacity over the class size yes uh, i believe the the answer to that question was spotted right and so two we know two of them are dual immersion and then the other three are not and so can you just let me explain to me what what we're doing with those other three classes that are over capacity and again just just like this previous point we're we're in final talk with the candidate to um offer them a position as well bring them on board um to to create an, an additional class for that for, for those classes that will essentially create a um or reduce those oversized classes so then in the end we'll only have two over correct class, and there will be the two dual immersion course classes. correct so I just, I mean, I just, I point that out because I just want us to understand, you know, what, what we're doing, right, in terms of what are, what, what, I think actions speak louder than words, right, and so that, 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 I think that sends a message to our community about, about, regardless of how much money we're spending on the program, that speaks, that, that speaks volumes in terms of, of, of this, the priority that we're placing on the program. So I just wanted to put that on the table. I, Adrian, I appreciate your much more political, you're much more politic way of creating things, but I, I do think we need to reflect on, on what we do better. I, I did want to just shift and talk about the um, the recruitment piece, right? Right. So one of the issues that I'm hearing, right, is, is that maybe that these courses are, are not fully, they're not under, in terms of student enrollment, they're under capacity, right? We don't have two classrooms of 24 students at kindergarten. And first. So my, my, my next area of questioning is around um, recruitment and how recruiting families Especially dual language learner families, English learner families, where you are, you are telling us they're outperforming all the other English learners. Here. So how are we making families aware about this option and encouraging them to to, to choose the dual immersion program? So our efforts are going to be to target those schools that have high populations of English learners, and especially working with our CSVP program identify those students early so that they can come into the program as early as TK or Finder. So that's going to be something that you were going to share? Yes, I am working on that this year. Okay, and I'd like to add something to that. Um, I know that we do put out a, a flyer in the summer one time in front of the dual immersion program to the community, right? Because actually, it, my hairdresser, you know, we were talking about um, how all of the immersion uh, programs. And oh, she's telling me her kids go to um, Community Valley, her grandkids, because she said, well, they have the program, but they speak the language, da, 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 da. and I looked at we have the same team at Azusa I didn't know about it, and she lives in Azusa. So this summer, um, I was surprised because she, I got a call from her daughter, Lucy, and Lucy goes, you want to, my mom's telling me that you guys have a dual immersion program, just like they did at Covina. I said, yes, we do. Where? Valleydale. She went there and she registered. She had two other grandchildren there coming from Mexico, because mm -hmm. their mom had to stay there. But anyways, they brought these two other little cousins, and they were at Covina Valley. And guess what? They're at Valleydale at AUSD. We're the mom. So uh, my concern really is uh, the build behind it. They do live in Azusa, Lucy lives in Azusa, Luke that the mom lives in Azusa, and they had no clue that we had to do a merger program. It was just out of a conversation. So uh, I'm really concerned about that, and I know we did once a year. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe we can do it in, in the fall and in the spring, just to remind and, and to the community. And I understand in, in the school sites, yes, to recruit, but what about the community? That the kids don't come here, that they have no children and it's a unified school. So how exactly. do we reach them? We do send a mailer, a postcard kind of mailer to I believe it goes to everybody in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we usually send that about January mm -hmm. um, to promote the, the dual immersion Spanish program. So, one of the ideas that came up in one of the ideas that came up in that in that parent meeting was around, so we brought up the idea of a family council. And I just, I think, I mean, I look at that those parents were so, um, you know, they really believe in the program. They're, they're our best advocates, they're our best messengers. And I think about promotoras, right? And really who listens to whom, right? And so I'm just wondering if we can think about how do we really engage these parents, dual immersion parents, or some of the most engaged parents that I've seen in the district. How do we capitalize on that and give them 
the agency to feel like like they they are our messengers and they are the ones that can help us strengthen the program and also recruit other parents. So I'm wondering how we can maybe make it more formalize that piece in terms of how, how are those parents going to be engaged to help grow the program. We have already had a conversation about putting together a dual immersion steering committee, which would consist of um, staff, parents, um, community members, and then um, to really look deeply at the program, promote the program, um, talk about how we can make some improvements, um, and have a stakeholder group um, that continues to support this program. Question. If, if I heard you correctly earlier, if someone's maybe a while ago, someone said that if, that, um, if we compare the numbers of our dual immersion students um, and maybe think of the, the academic achievement results that we looked at, that those those numbers are, are higher with the dual immersion students. Is there, is there a way for us to, to you know, see those? And, and I can share that data with you. So, what I was speaking to you is when we look at English learners who are participating in dual immersion versus English learners who are participating in a structured English immersion class, which is where they receive integrated ELD throughout their day and in a designated time. Our English learners who are in a dual immersion program, which obviously is high target language, which is a strength for them. When we look at their data over five years, which is where we are at in the program, we see that those English learners outperform English learners in the SDI program. So I can put together some graphs for you to look at in terms of how they perform on the LPAC, the English um, language um, performance test, and also on our internal assessments, reading assessments, those kinds of things. Can we can we include um, kind, of, kind of the general, you know, I don't know if that's the proper term, the general, the students are, who are not in that program as well? Just, just yes, so if you want to see a comparison between English learners in an SEI versus English learners in dual immersion. Correct, yeah. along with the others. And then my last question is just a timing thing. So I appreciate you saying that you're going back and you're looking at the staffing to figure out um, you know, how you're going to deal with the situation and how. So when can we expect to have a clear understanding of what that solution is? Well, we have a we actually have our meeting next week, I believe, um, to begin to uh, plan out our process, uh, create a timeline, um, and then we will update you uh, in uh, weekly board packets. But the other goal too is to be able to communicate to that to our parents as well. Um, that was a commitment that we made at the meeting that we would be communicating that out uh, to them so that they would be informed. Great, thank you so much. Um, Narva. Um, Gina and Jorge for uh, for um, to chair and thank you to our board members and the parents and I really like I said before I really believe in this program and it can only get better. It each year my daughter's a junior and she started with the dual immersion program and she wants to start to get that seal. So I I look forward to the improvements um, and hearing with the parents and the input that has been brought forth, and I, I trust that it will become an even stronger program. Thank you. Moving on to uh, Human Resources 14.1, California School Employee Association, CSEA Sunshine Proposal for the 2021-2022 Fiscal Year Negotiation. Yes, Board of Education, this is a uh, government requirement. This is a um, an information item announcing the beginning of negotiation, um, and this is CSCA's uh, uh, proposal for um, the articles that they want to open and negotiate during the negotiation year. Um, there are um, there is three components to this. Uh, so the first fourteen point one is the information item. Fourteen point two is a hearing and um, I'd like to say that this is the uh, one opportunity that the uh, public and community have to speak to the articles that will be negotiated during the um, during the negotiation here. And then the last piece is the board to action. 
Great, thank you. We'll move on to 14.2. Can I get a motion to open public hearing? Mm -hmm. Second. And this is the time where we receive public input on CSA sunshine proposal. Yeah, I'm just what I was going to read it and then I was going to um, to receive public input on CSA Sunshine proposal for the 2022 fiscal year negotiation between the California School Employees Association (CSEA) and the Susa Unified School District. Can I get a motion to move 14.2? It's moved by I've moved it in. Uh, I did a so we have a first by Board Member Greer and a second by. Rodriguez, Ms. Uh, Board Member Rodriguez Pena, do we have any uh, comments at this point? Just for clarity, the motion is to open the public hearing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Did I do that? With the vote. With the vote. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and vote. And pacifies there. Now, at this time, it is open to the public. Do we have anybody online? Mika? Actually, do not have any hand raised. Great, thank you. And we're now moving on to, it passes by zero, moving on to 14.3. Yeah, technically we probably should close that public hearing before we move on to 14.3. At this point, um, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing 14.2. That I'll have to, 14.2. The Board of Education is required to officially approve the California School Employees Association CFCA Sunshine Proposal for the 2021-22 fiscal year negotiations with the SUSE Unified School District AUSD. Can I get a motion to approve 14.3? So Second. We have a first by Board Member Greer, second by Board Member Rodriguez Pena. So we can vote. I'm so sorry, I forgot this student preferential vote. So sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. We have we can cast our vote. And it passes five zero. We moved now to our adjournment fifteen point one. Adjournment. Can I please get a motion to adjourn? That'd be first by Board Member Greer, second Board Member Rodriguez Pena. And can we please get the student preferential vote? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And it, can we please get our vote? It passes 5 0. It is 9 54, and our meeting is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Have a great rest of your night, and we hope to see you guys soon.